Well, good evening. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Newport News School Board for Tuesday, August 17th, 2021. On behalf of the members of the school board and the superintendent, I welcome each of you present and watching. A quorum is present to transact the business of the school division. The COVID-19 pandemic and now the Delta variant continue to affect how we conduct business. Personal barriers are installed between the members of the board and our staff and visitors are masked and socially distanced in the auditorium. We are taking steps to ensure the health and well-being of our staff and the public. We value and appreciate your partnership. We'll begin tonight's meeting with an invocation and pledge to the flag. Here to do the honors is Nisha White, a rising ninth grader at Woodside High School. Thank you for joining us, Ms. White. Please uh, come to the podium and tell us a little bit about yourself before you uh, deliver the invocation. Um, my name is Nisha White and I am an uprising ninth grader at Woodside High School for the theater magnet. And um, this year I just had my first experience at SIA also for theater. Um, so today I'll be sharing my experience from SIA. Right as I came in, I could tell that the environment was very welcoming and that it was like the perfect place for me to be. Um, Ms. Sheehan Smith was the perfect person to be leading the program because she always had something unique in store for us students to complete. Um, there was also Mr. Kearns, who was the first teacher that I met. I enjoyed him very much. He was my favorite. <laughs> um, then there was also Ms. Rice, Ms. Eason, and Ms. Hunter, who all had something interesting to contribute to our learning experience. Um, I learned almost everything that you could learn about theater in just 12 days, which was pretty amazing. <laughs> um, I learned everything from script writing to choreography, which was amazing. And the atmosphere, again, was very welcoming. Everybody was so supportive of each other, and they all enjoyed everything. And I got to make a lot of friends who started to slowly feel like family. So the last day was really hard. Um, and if I could recommend this experience to like all the students everywhere, I recommend it 10 out of 10. This was the best thing ever that I could do. So. As I conclude, I'd like to thank everybody here for listening to me and having me be able to have this experience so I can share this with you all. And just thank you to the school board for letting this opportunity still be available for us students to complete because you can learn so much and have so much fun at the same time. And the arts really are something that you could use like for your daily lives. It's not just something that's useless. It makes us happy and it keeps us entertained. And thank you for listening to me. So now could everybody please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. White, for those words of encouragement from our Summer Institute for the Arts program. So glad that it uh, touched you and, and had meaning for you. Uh, joining Ms. White this evening are members of her family. I would ask them to please stand and be recognized at this time. I believe we have uh, Katie Sheehan Smith uh, as well, the Magnet Program Administrator at Woodside High School, and other members of the Woodside family, if you could stand and be recognized at this time. Wonderful. The next item on tonight's agenda is school board recognitions. This evening we are formally welcoming, welcoming this year's student representative to the school board. Uh, Dr. Parker, would you please join me at the podium? Yes, sir. Ms. Patterson, would you please come forward to receive your oath of commitment? Your family members are welcome to join you uh, up here behind me as well. All right. Uh, Ms. Patterson, as the school board chair, I have the honor and privilege of leading your oath of commitment. If you would please raise your right hand. Now please repeat after me. I 
Amaya C. Patterson, do solemnly affirm. That I will support the mission of Newport News Public Schools. That I will support the mission of Newport News Public Schools. And will faithfully perform my duties as a student representative to the school board. And will faithfully perform my duties as a student representative to the school board. I will attend school board meetings and participate in board functions. I will attend school board meetings and participate in board functions. I will serve as a facilitator to the superintendent student advisory group on education. I will serve as a facilitator to the student advisory group on education. I will contribute to school board discussion. I will strive to fulfill the responsibilities of this position while excelling in my studies. I will strive to perform the responsibilities of this position while excelling in my studies. According to the best of my abilities. According to the best of my abilities. Ms. Patterson, congratulations and welcome to the school board. So it will um, ask you to just say a few words, Ms. Patterson, a reflection, and then we will stand in recess. Oh, yeah, we do. <laughs> the floor is yours, Ms. Patterson. Please go ahead. this position for the upcoming school year of course these um, past couple of years have been unexpected and a challenge but it's been amazing to see how people especially behind this, the scenes have adapted and done as much as they can to make the school year beneficial for everyone and I'm very excited to be a part of that in some way and just learn the ropes around here and do as much as I possibly can to help and be supportive and next time I come here, I will not get lost trying to find the bathroom. So <laughs> once again, I'm very excited. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. And now at this time, as we normally do so at this point in our meetings, we will take a, a short recess so that uh, uh, folks who have come here as, uh, as dignitaries can uh, recess if they choose to do so. At that time, uh, members of the public will be able to view the school board spotlight. As the school year came to a close, five Newport News Public Schools were honored for their efforts to promote a positive school culture. Nelson, Riverside, and Centerfield Elementary Schools, along with Hines Middle and Warwick High, were the winners of the prestigious Stand Award. This is the highest honor earned by schools for demonstrating a commitment to student involvement, encouraging professional development for educators, creating opportunities for students to build leadership skills, and promoting a positive school culture by discouraging bullying and harassment. Based on these four qualifications, a diverse committee of independent reviewers scored all submissions, with these five schools earning top grades. Throughout the school year, each of these schools went above and beyond in their efforts to creatively keep students, staff, and families engaged. Whether it was online or safely in person, these schools are committed to offering opportunities and resources to ensure students reach their fullest potential, academically, socially, and emotionally. The Stan Prize Patrol personally visited each school and surprised school leaders and staff with the exciting news. Schools received a banner to proudly hang, along with fun gifts to recognize their ongoing efforts. Nelson and Riverside Elementary are now three-time winners of the Stan Award Warwick has earned the award twice, while Sedgefield and Hines are both first-time winners this year. And Sedgefield's principal, Jackie Barber, is the first school leader to earn the Stand Award at two different schools. Congratulations to each of these schools as they continue preparing students to be world leaders and contributing citizens.
at Gildersleeve Middle School, teachers became the students for some fun physical activities, while at the same time, earning valuable professional development points towards their teaching license. Gildersleeve's physical education teachers adapted some of the great lessons normally taught to their students and offered staff members two four-week sessions covering bike safety and overall wellness through sports and play. Twice a week, educators were welcome to participate, earning one professional development point for each day they attended. During the eight-day bike safety course, teachers learned how to inspect their bike, properly fit their helmet, use hand signals to safely communicate, ride in groups, and techniques for starting and braking safely. With more people riding bikes, this was an important course to help teachers stay safe on the roads. Newport News Public Schools realizes physical wellness outside of the classroom is important for teachers to continue doing their job effectively. As staff members increased their confidence and abilities, they extended their rides into nearby neighborhoods as they geared up for a safe summer of bike riding with their friends and family. Before the end of the school year, Gildersleeve's PE teachers also hosted a four-week course focused on small group and lifetime individual sports along with other fun physical activities. For many educators, they were experiencing these sports for the very first time, including golf, racket sports, archery, fishing, and rock wall climbing. The goal was to have fun playing with coworkers while providing social, emotional, and physical wellness. One of the byproducts of these experiences was increased confidence and empowerment for the teachers as they shot their first bullseye or hit the perfect golf shot. A living legend gave a recent Newport News Public Schools graduate the opportunity to further her own legacy through STEM. Dr. Christine Mandarden, one of the four human computers made famous in the Hidden Figures book, presented recent heritage graduate Morgan Moore with a $500 scholarship. The Dr. Christine Mandarden STEM scholarship was created last school year in partnership with the NNPS Bloom Empowerment Initiative and the Newport News Chapter of the Links Incorporated. Bloom focuses on encouraging female champions to see themselves as world changers while The Lynx sponsors the local junior chapter of the National Society of Black Engineers. Morgan Moore will be attending North Carolina A&T State University in the fall, with hopes of using her STEM skills to become a data analyst, the same job that Dr. Darden first held on her skyrocketed journey to success. Getting children to attend school during a global pandemic was a major task for families. To reward the dedicated preschool and kindergarten students who earned perfect attendance, Marshall Early Learning Center hosted the Great Bike Giveaway. Each week, one student was randomly selected from those who were attending classes virtually or in person regularly. The winning student from each week was able to pick out a brand new bike and helmet, which were generously donated by community partners, businesses, and educators at Marshall. One lucky student even received the exact bike he fell in love with while browsing at a store. Students who submitted attendance through their nudge card were also rewarded with a gift card to McDonald's. Through this creative initiative, Marshall's attendance numbers saw improvement as the year progressed. Families were overjoyed with the gifts, but mostly proud of their students for staying dedicated to their own academic success by showing up to learn.
Well, welcome back. We hope you enjoy this month's school board spotlight. During our regular meetings, we provide time for the public to address the school board. These opportunities are scheduled in the early part of our agenda and also towards the end of the meeting. The school board recognizes that during the pandemic, some members of the public may not be able to join us in person. As advertised, citizens may submit comments via a web form, email, or voicemail up to 30 minutes prior to our meeting time to be included in the official meeting record. For those of you joining us in person, the board considers this an opportunity to listen to your comments, not to respond. Please understand that we will consider your concerns and get back to you at a later time. We ask that you comply with our three minute time limit. As you begin your comments, you'll see a green light will come on over there to the, to the clerk side. A yellow light signals that you have 30 seconds remaining, which means please wrap up your comments. And a red light beep indicates that your time is up. Because we have a lot of speaker cards tonight, we want to make sure that everyone respects the three minute time rule. So please co comply with that as, as, you, as you come up. And then as your name is called, please come forward. Uh, we do have more cards than, than is allowed in this, this 30 minute session, but we'll, uh, we're gonna try to accommodate as many speakers as we can. Uh, with that in mind, we've bundled the cards into the, the <coughs> folks who wanted to speak specifically on our action item. That's gonna be coming up in item four. We wanted to give them a chance to make sure that we heard from them before we uh, held our vote. So the first card I have is uh, Guy and Robin Levy. Please come forward. And we may need to allow for a little time if some folks are in the hallway um, to come, come forward. And what we'll do, I'll go to, I'm going to hold this card. We'll go to the next card. And if that, as Mr. a speaker, Ms. Comes Levy. Up. Did they hear you? Levy. And so while we're waiting for Mr. Levy, we'll go to uh, John Wright. And then come back to Mr. Levy. John Wright is, is here. Oh, Levy's coming. Okay. Mr. John Wright, you'll be you'll be next. John Wright will be next. Good Take evening. your time. I know it was a long walk. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, good evening, and uh, to the school board, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute these comments. As the Newport News School Board considers transgender and other person-defining policies, please consider the purpose of our Centers for Learning, Growing Good Citizens. This is not the first time, and it will not be the last time, that the school board is confronted with establishing policy related to inclusion based on students' identity, appearance, ability, belief, and or social status. The unit of measurement for assessing any of these policies should be kindness. Does the policy encourage kindness, acceptance, and respect for all students? Does the policy discourage exclusion, disrespect, isolation, and bullying? Specific to human sexual anatomy and identification, there are no clear binary pathways as we may have been taught in school. Our sex is determined by genetic coding, XX for girls and XY for boys, right? What about XXY, XYY, XXYY, etc.? There is also other genetic coding that contributes to the development of our sexual anatomy and identity from within our own human genome, as well as from the genome of our microbiome. Our microbiome are the multitude of bacteria, fungi, and viruses that live and thrive within us and significantly influence the expression of our own genes. Our resident microbiome is more populated than the human cells in our body. All of this is influenced by chemicals in the food we eat, the water we drink, and the air we breathe. What do we know? We know there is a systematic balance in our bodies which includes a combination of male and female attributes which contribute to our sexual anatomy and identification. For many people, some aspects of both male and female characteristics are expressed both mentally and physically. Our brain processes this information through millions of proteins that are exchanged and transmitted throughout our bodies, leading to a status where there are people who do not align with what some consider our societal norms. 
Some people look male but are actually female, look female but are actually male, look androgynous and are male, female, non-binary, any, any combination of the former. Sexual depravity has absolutely nothing to do with sexual identification, just as sexual depravity has nothing to do with appearance, ability, belief, and or social status. We humans are complicated. We are the children of God made in God's image. We are closest to God when we do not judge our children but treat them with kindness and love. Please create policies that build a safe, inclusive, respectful, and nonviolent learning environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Levy. <clears throat> Mr. John Wright. Good evening, John Wright. Uh, I've raised three sons and three grandchildren. And as of 10 days ago, I have a great-grandchild coming. It upsets me that we may teach rather than just inform people about CRT. I believe all of us are created equal in the sight of God. We don't need some professor 50 years ago coming up with a theory that changes that. As to the transgender issue, <clears throat> I've thought about this long and hard. My bottom line is if my granddaughter were to come home and tell me that she had been in a bathroom with a man or a boy and had seen what he had, I would have been very upset. I hope I don't have to go through that, but if we continue to give credit to this transgender issue, we may all have our daughters and or sons subjected to something they should not be subjected to in the early years of their lives. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Our uh, next card is uh, Neverett Yarbrough and the uh, card after that will be uh, Pastor Russell Evenson. Thank you, my name is Never Yarbo. I'll be quick. Across Virginia, the rights of non-transgendered students are being infringed upon. The example of that is if a male teacher can be transgendered and sexual organs physically intact, and this person can use the girl's bathroom or locker room forcing a female student to see his private areas. This is simply wrong. The transgender believes he may be she or vice versa. It is what he believes. There's no science behind that. It is his faith, but his faith should not supersede any other. There must be another way to protect all rights. We made a pledge of allegiance this, this morning. We started with this, I'm sorry, this afternoon, this evening, I'm sorry. Uh, we had a pledge of allegiance. I listened to it. We made a pledge. What is a, what is a pledge of loyalty to the flag and to the Republic of the United States of America? And it states that one nation under God. That's what it says. That's what the Baptist minister wrote many years ago. And that's what they believe, our forefathers believed. If it is not so, then they should take it out. And that's how I feel. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Yarbrough. Pastor Russell Evenson. My name is Pastor Russell Evenson. I'm senior pastor at World Outreach Worship Center here in Newport News. Mm -hmm. I reside at 103 Russell Goat Ridge in Yorktown. I represent a congregation of approximately 1,200 members. Many are here tonight filling these rooms, and I'm proud of them. I thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight with some concerns that we have with the Virginia Department of Education transgender policies. First, I'd like to say that we believe, I believe personally, that all people have a right, no matter what their skin color is or their sexual preference is, they have a free will that has been given to them by the Creator. But our ground for opposition to uh, the model policies for the treatment of the transgender students in Virginia's public school they have some real concerns for us. Number one, it encourages the school system, according to the law and the, the policies of that, to keep secrets from parents. 
that thereby not informing parents of their child's best interest in the form of that while a child is at school, they can choose their gender identity, unbeknowings to the parent. And as a school would have to deal with the parent, they deal with the child according to the parents, uh, or according to the child's birth, uh, sex, gender on their birth certificate. I realize the board, you already have policies in place. I've looked those up and I've read them, most of them word for word, and they're very good. I encourage you tonight to stick with those policies that are already in place that guide you, that direct you. I think they're good. Uh, I won't go through them because I think you're very well aware of them. Uh, the family education program, actually part of that says that it's based on the premise that parents should be the primary providers of the information and the values of family and human sexuality. We believe that. These children and youth, they really belong to the parents. They don't belong to the state or to the federal government. Number two, parents should be not be parents should not be punished as abusers because they don't identify with their child's choice of gender identity. We all know parents, we all know families have conflict within them, parents and children. I went through it in the 70s with my parents wanting to have long hair and then it was not cool. And uh, I got plenty of uh, trips to the barber shop against my will to get my hair cut like my dad wanted it cut. I rebelled and I know that happens in families. And so, you know, this could possibly, I'm not saying it would definitely, it could possibly cause parents to be put in a bad light as abusers, bringing child custody agency against parents for unnecessary causes and reasons. Thirdly, the policy could possibly jeopardize the privacy and physical safety of all students, as has already been mentioned tonight. Uh, it's just not a good thing that uh, they're allowed to do that. Draws more attention to uh, the differences in people rather than the unity of them. Thank you for your attention tonight. Thank you, Pastor Russell Evenson. The next card I have is Effie Ambrose Ianbor, and a card after that will be Frank Broadwater. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. It's um, <clears throat> Effie Ambrose Ianbor. Um, I'm here to talk um, on the transgender uh, mother policy. I'll just highlight a couple of points. Um, as a parent, I would say adopting and enforcing and implementing this policy is akin to normalizing perverse sexual behaviors and lifestyle choices that are plain wrong. Um, I can't just stand by and you know tolerate this. I want to speak to the community in love, but I won't. I would not stand by to tolerate perversion in the form of education to the detriment of our children and the community. Like a child allergic to certain substances, availing the child any substance or item which the child is allergic to under the guise of a tolerant policy is tantamount to implementing this policy that we're about to adopt. Where do we draw the line? Do we allow it to reach such a level that the right thing becomes intolerable and we are, are banned from stating what is right so as not to offend? Would we as a community consider discussing this policy if funding were not an issue? I know um, there's federal funding that we receive in the um, um, education system. If we're not lacking funding, would this even be considered in the first place? Um, I'm not here to debate um, a gray issue, um, area issue where um, relativism is in contention here. This is simple, it's clear, it's plain for all to see. Our physical and morphological um, traits are not in question here. It is very obvious. Or is there anyone in doubt as to what their gender is? If you're in doubt, go to the bathroom in your birthday suit and you can envision what you created as. I'm requesting and appealing that this policy be eradicated for the sake of the mental health of our children and wards. When we enable the wrong thing and embrace the wrong thing for so long, amending it becomes a difficult um, issue. But it's not too late to turn <coughs> the corner and turn the tide. So I'm appealing to us this evening. Thank you, and I hope you consider this. Thank you. Frank Broadwater, and next card will be Colette Munn. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, my bra. 
This lady and I, we've had three daughters. We have now 17 great grandchildren, 10 grandchildren. And I try to make my children street wise without them ever getting on the streets. Never to go to jail for any of them. I educated them on the facts of life. And I depend upon just the public school system. But I'll say this here, even though I'm a product of the public school system, I know one thing that has become a great disease in America. And that's a disease called ignorance, and it's based on choice. We choose to be ignorant. Now, unfortunately, I believe many parents have abdicated their responsibility in ensuring their children know what they need to know. Otherwise, we need to have better trained cops. We need just better trained students because their parents trained them well. My point, I oppose the transgender education because in my educational time in life, I have done a lot of research, and guess what I found? I found that the first textbook this nation ever had was the Bible. I found that the law, the act called the, guess what? The Luger Satan Act, 1647 in Massachusetts. They didn't want any student to be ignorant of the principles of the Bible. Did not but it required the parents to make sure the students learn how to read and to write. Unfortunately, that's not being taught anymore. That was in 1600, but guess what happened in 1800s? We developed a form of education called the Prussian form of educational system, where the state dictates what's being trained at the public level. So since then, we've never had a public school in a sense. We've had a government school run by the state, managed by the public or local student cities. Unfortunately, I don't think it's working that well. Though you guys might be doing your job well, you are being directed to teach and provide information that the students have. Hence, as a former educator, temporarily, I didn't pass my GRE, <clears throat> so I didn't get my master's degree. I was at a school, not to name it, that unfortunately, there was some failure there. They weren't promoting the Republic reporting the democracy, which our nation was not built on. Unfortunately, that's being taught. And the more you hear a lie, that lie becomes the truth. I'm going to close with this comment here. One great person says, all motion <coughs> is not forward, just like all change is not progress. And I would say this here, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The transgender education is taking the rights from parents and now instead of a school where our kids go for education, they've been indoctrinated. Please refuse to accept transgender. Thank you, Mr. Broadwater. Next part of it is uh, Colette Munn and after uh, Ms. Munn, it'll be Susan Youngbluff. Good evening. I am here to um, represent my five-year-old granddaughter who is bright, intelligent, well-trained at home, and to find out that the DOE wants to teach this agenda to our children, I can't believe it. I raised four girls that graduated from the New News High, High School um, system, and so did I. And I would like to say that I'm asking you to vote no for the LGBT agenda being taught to our children. The majority of our students identify with their birth as their birth sex that they were born with. Why take this privacy and physical safety rights away from those that identify with who they are and give the rights and confirmation to the few who do not accept their birth sex? Some of those students identify even as others. Today I'm she, tomorrow I'm it, and tomorrow I might be a him. And um, I, I can be a girl today and a boy tomorrow. If they have, um, if they have their birth sex anatomy, then they should use the bathroom of their choice, whether it be a girl or a boy, in the locker room, in the gym room. Not only that, so now the school staff becomes the parent with all the rights and teaching of the deception and lying, keeping secrets, 
they become the watchers of the parents to find out whether the parents are mistreating the identity that the child is told that they are when they're at school and when they're at home, they're somebody else. Um, you can't even concern, I mean, you can't even be concerned if a boy go in a girl's bathroom. You don't ask, you won't be able to ask him what is he doing there. He just get the right to go there. And we already know that you're opening up a can, of, it would open up a can of worms because all boys that might go in the girl's bathroom or vice versa will not be going in there for the reason to use the restroom. So at the start, this at K kindergarten level, these children are innocent and they love everybody. That brings on the point of teaching them that CRT agenda. That will only mask and bring out more hate and separation. We already see what the separation is doing even with these masses that I'm struggling to keep around my ears. You know how it's dividing the people. This is not good. The word, um, the, our Constitution gives us God-given rights. God himself gave us <laughs> God-given rights. And we as Americans, we are not ready to give up our rights. We are still parents. Thank you. Thank you. Next card is uh, Mr. Eric Olenberger. And after that, it'll be uh, Todd Gruber. My name is Susan Youngblood. I ask that you do not vote yes on either proposed gender policy or procedure tonight. This policy rammed through session and the model policy issued by the Virginia DOE was done without any thought or guidance as to how it will be implemented by local boards. That was left up for you to do, much like any recent legislation. You did not get allowable time to thoughtfully contemplate your thought process hear from your constituents, engage your teachers and staff, or the public in general. It rings a bell, we'll pass it, and then we'll deal with those particulars. Not any way to govern, nor make vital decisions affecting our community's children. My major concern with the policy is the delineation out of the myriad of gender-related terms added to the discrimination policies and procedures. If passed, this will be taken to court, and the question will become, why are not the other classifications delineated out? Do we need to list all the religions, all the races, all the colors that your children might be? Why does every classification not have pages of specific procedures unique to it? This issue is not more or less important than any other parent or child in the <coughs> school who may be discriminated against because they might be Catholic, Italian, or short. This is political correctness. You were elected by the people of Newport News to oversee the education of our children so that they will become productive members of society and someday give back to a community. I will guarantee you that no parent elected you to dictate the policy a legislature has passed or develop procedures about a personal issue that honestly is none of any of our businesses. If there is no policy on a non-transgender child, why is there a policy for a transgender child? My second issue revolves around the fluidity of gender in your procedures and the implication for teachers who merely want to teach our children how to read, how to add, how to write, how to learn science, history, and delve into arts. The burden placed upon these teachers to not only face reprimand if they do not use the correct pronoun, but also upon them to notify a parent, not notify a parent of a child as young as four who may say they want to be a sex for a minute, an hour, or a day is unconscionable to me. Who in their right mind would teach and put themselves in that position? And what parent would knowingly give up their right to be informed of the most personal matters for their own children? Perhaps at your retreat meeting last week, you mentioned eight sessions of training for teachers, another burden placed upon them, taking them away from educating all our students. I urge you to vote no on the proposed policy. Doing so would have no negative ramifications to the district, like losing funding. Then the district can take the time to work out reasonable policies if necessary. I implore you to look inward and not to politicians. Do what is right by all the parents and children of Newport News because you believe it is right, not because it's been dictated and that we should think and feel about any issue Thank they you. tell us. Thank you for your time that you give to the community and for stepping up to serve us. 
Thank you, Mr. Youngblood. Ready for me to start go speaking? ahead yes, okay. Mr. O yes Mr. all right well hello my name is eric Olenberger, and i am here to address the uh, model policies for treatment of transgender students um coming up here i first want to say thank you for serving i know that especially in times like these it can be very difficult to serve in a uh, public uh, any type of public entity so i don't envy you <laughs> that said i'm coming up here <coughs> I'm a father of a little girl, and no one in the entire school system loves her more than I do. That is where I am coming from, and that is why as I looked through these policies set down from Richmond, I have several concerns. Uh, three main concerns popped out to me. Uh, those include uh, the policies are vague, making it hard to enforce. Uh, the policies take control and consent from parents' hands. And in the policies, I see little evidence to show that uh, affirming a child's transgender identity actually helps the child. So I'm just going to read excerpts from this policy uh, describe, uh, that emphasize my point, and uh, that's just how I'll roll. So on page 13 of the policies, for the um, confusing bit of it, this is an excerpt. For many transgender students, their daily emotional and psychological wellness are dependent on receiving support and recognition from their gender identity. A transgender student may adopt a name that is different from their legal name on their birth certificate and use pronouns reflective of their gender identity. Many transgender students will adopt the gender pronouns typically associated with their gender identity. For example, most transgender girls will use she, her, hers uh, pronouns, while most trans transgender boys will use he, him, his pronouns. There may be a less common pattern of pronoun usage among non-binary students. Non-binary students as well as neutral pronouns such as they, them, their, or z, her, hers. You may use multiple sets of pronouns interchangeably or use their name in place of any pronoun. School divisions should accept a student's assert assertion of their gender identity <clears throat> without requiring any particular substantiating evidence including diagnosis, treatment, or legal documents. A student is considered transgender if, at school, the student consistently asserts a gender identity, different from the sex assigned at birth. This should involve more than a casual declaration of gender identity, but it does not necessarily require any substantiating evidence nor any required minimum duration of expressed gender identity. I am an engineer by trade, and I would be floored if I had to follow rules like that. Um, all right. Just 30 seconds remaining, Mr. Walsh. Okay. The second is policies uh, take consent from the parents, and I will leave it at this. Uh, in here it states, there are no regulations requiring school staff to notify a parent or guardian of a student's request to affirm their gender identity. So unfortunately I took too much time, but I appreciate uh, you having me up here. Those were two of the concerns I had, and, uh, but I appreciate the time you gave me. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Todd Gruber. And after Mr. Gruber, we'll have uh, Deidre Hayden. Hello. Uh, thank you. My name is Todd Gruber. I have two kids in Newport News Public Schools and a third that will be there in a couple of years. Uh, I'm here to express my support for adopting the transgender model policies. Um, transgender students have some of the highest uh, suicide rates of any kids and there is a large body of data that suggests that supporting those students uh, in their gender identities is very helpful uh, for avoiding suicidal ideation and for good long-term outcomes. Um, and from my perspective, it's a pretty easy thing to do. Um, if somebody, if I meet somebody and they say their name is Bob, I call them Bob. If I meet somebody and they say their name is Janet, I call them Janet. Um, and that's a very easy thing for me to do. I've been thinking as I hear these comments about uh, comments about you know stuff going on in bathrooms. I've been in a lot of bathrooms uh, in my life, including some with my daughters. Uh, we have never seen anyone's genitals. Uh, 
And so I don't understand the connection or the worry. I would have no problems or concerns whatsoever if there were transgender people uh, in the bathroom with me or with uh, my children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Deidre Hayden. And next we will have uh, Sandra Tumanel. Thank you, Mr. Brown and board members. I'm a concerned citizen, I'm a mother, I'm a former school teacher, and I'm the mother of a gay son. To quote from your agenda document, each student will be given equal educational opportunity. Also, educational programs and services will be designed to meet the varying needs of all students and not discriminate against any individual for reasons of race, color, national origin, sex, and the list continues, unquote. Biological males and females should not be discriminated against by forcing them to be on single sex teams with another student who identifies as the opposite biological sex. Biological males and females should not be discriminated against by forcing them to share a locker room, a restroom, or a hotel room on an overnight field trip with another student who identifies as the opposite biological sex. That is discrimination against those students. Those students with sexual identities other than their biological sex should be accommodated and cared for and loved and encouraged, but they should not have their rights override the rights of so many other students, the parents, and the community. Please vote no. In closing, I'd like to say, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Let's not go down that path. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hayden. Ms. Sandra Tumaninello. Hi. I feel almost at home. I was a guidance counselor in Newport News for 45 years, a math teacher, so I've been in this room many times. Times have changed, and not for the better, I'm afraid. And I don't envy you in your job, and I thank you for your time and consideration. <clears throat> Transgender mandates are causing a lot of discussion, arguments, and anger in Virginia. A few years ago, this term was non-existent. Now all students are being by, affected by this push that's fueled by political motives in the most part, and ask yourselves why. Working with thousands of students for 45 years, I never encountered anyone with a serious problem with this transgender issue. There were a few students who had, were going through conflicts with their sexual identity, but it was worked through. And I'll give you just a short example. When I was a counselor at Gildersleeve, one of my last years there, there were six or seven girls who were calling themselves lesbians. I mean, the talk was out, people were going nuts over it, because this was long enough ago that it wasn't so accepted. And it, it was crazy, so they were, they all, these girls often came into my office for lunch just to eat and talk about issues, and I welcomed them, anyone who wanted to come in and just talk about anything, because I was very open. And they <clears throat> talked about the fact that they were, uh, you know, people were talking about them and what was wrong with that. One of them said, well, what is, what is, you're a Christian, what does the Bible say? And I said, that's a good question. I said, what, what religion are y'all? They all said they were Christian, I don't know if they were or not. But um, I said, well, what, what do you think the Bible says about it? And the girl said, I've got a Bible in my locker. I'll bring it in and show you. So they passed it around, and each of them read a passage. And finally, they said, I don't think that's God's will. And I said, why hadn't our preacher ever told us that? And I said, well, you go tell your preacher that the school is having to do his job because y'all at least need to be discussing this, regardless of what the answer is. And I had those parents of all those girls individually came in to thank me for that because it opened up discussion at home. One of the girls thought she was lesbian, and, and 
you know, I didn't cast any judgment on that, but her father wanted to know and, and wanted to work with it and get suggestions for that. So I think that that's really important. But now it seems that that all of us, and of course, as a, as a Christian, I believe that we're created male and female. And it's only been in more recent years that this has been coming up like this. I'm old enough, I've seen the difference. And I have two master's degrees, so I know what all the literature says and the experts. And this is a new phenomenon, which I think is brought out a lot by Hollywood, um, sports team, blah, blah, blah. But I want you to consider all this seriously and think about it because the parents, Thank you, Mr. Uh, and Bell. ministers and teachers can work together to help these kids. Thank you. Thank you. At this, at this time, I have uh, reached my 30 minute allotted time for uh, this session. And so in order to uh, continue the session, I would need a motion uh, in order to continue the session. So Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we continue this session for 15 minutes. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Is there a second? Second. A second by Mr. Harris. Any discussion? All right. There being none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Ely? Four. Harris? Four. Hunter? Four. Searles Law? Four. Amon? Four. Best? Four. Brown? Four. Motion carries 7 0. All right. Thank you all so much for your cooperation. We have been able to get through 13 cards in our allotted 30 minute time period. So thank you all for your cooperation and that we're able to hear from so many folks. So hopefully we'll be able to get through the rest of our cards in the 15 minutes that we have remaining. Uh, the, I'll, I'll call these in order. The uh, first next two cards I have is Pamela Ayers and Shawnee Graf uh, Cheese, Cheese Chisina? Cheeseman. <coughs> so much for hearing our hearts and our minds. Uh, my name's Pamela Ayers. <clears throat> I'm a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. And for the last 21 years, I've been a children's minister. But in the past year and a half, I've added a work with the youth in our church. And I began to hear as I was talking to these 13 to 15-year-olds a pressure, a constant need to discuss something that felt very pressured to him, them. So when I came up with this book two weeks ago, it's only been published in the last few months, it's called Irreversible Damage, because I kept hearing it as though they're talking about something so serious like it was a fad, which I had fads in the 60s, but we got over them, but this is very serious. It's called The Transgender Craze, Seducing Our Daughters. So I want to use my three minutes to read you just a short passage. John Hopkins University Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry, psych, Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Paul McHugh, has an answer to gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is an overvalued idea or ruling passion. This is an idea held by many people in the world, but held intensely by the patient or the person <coughs> who is making a life of that idea. Dr. McHugh said, many people believe that it is good to be thin, for instance. Many adolescent girls believe it's better to be a boy. But for anorexics and those with gender dysphoria, those ideas become all-consuming. One key difference between this and past psychiatric crazes is that the transgender epidemic seems primarily induced by peers and the media and schools. Today's teens don't wait to talk to a therapist to find out what's wrong with them. They simply park themselves in front of a screen and Google, am I trans? And self-diagnose from the list of symptoms. If anything, therapists are merely exasperating or encouraging a problem already begun. But Dr. McHugh believes the transgender craze will likely end as the multiple personality craze did in the courts with patients suing their doctors. Some of these teenage girls, he says, will wake up at age 23, 24, and say, here I am. I've got a five o'clock shadow. I'm mutilated and I'm sterile. And I'm not what I ought to be. How did this happen? This is a journalistic book. There's 33 pages of references for it. And I really, as a teacher for the past 21 years, want to remind us all that John 
No, excuse me, James 3.1 says, not many of you should be teachers because we who teach will be more severely judged. Thank you. All right, Ms. Cheeseman. And next card will be uh, Mark Linton. Thank you so much for allowing us to come out here and express our uh, opinions on all that is going on. And thank you for listening with the pandemic and everything going on and you guys being exhausted to come here and listen. So we thank you. I just have one question and you're not able to answer this, but I'll answer, I'll ask it anyway. You have a policy that is revised and it's a SOL policy standard of learning social teaching, equal educational opportunities. I know you can't answer that, but what is that in its totality? What are you teaching in that? What type of learning social teaching is that? Will it be all of what everybody's talking about? If it is, please take it in consideration that we as a people, mother, grandmother, aunt, some of our uncles of women and men, we want you guys to take in consideration that these are children that need to be teached and learned about academic learning, art, how to realize that we are all created equal, that they need to learn to be able to play with each other, and that these teachings are teachings that are for someone that goes to college that is more mature and able to understand and how to decipher how not to be encringed or infringed on their way of living. For the children that are growing up, their minds are still young. They cannot process this. It will damage them. They will be damaged goods with this type of teaching, with this type of learning. Not sure what this is, and you can't answer that right now. I've, I'm sorry that you're not able to. But if you can be transparent on this revised policy, equal educational opportunities, SOL, standard of learning social teachings can you please let us know what that means can you please send out a transparency on what it is that you want to teach our children grandchildren nieces nephews all of that we would really like to know what that means and is it any of the what these people are talking about is it you can't answer me right now you can't answer them but we just want to know what is it? Is it that? And if it is, please take it in consideration. Please leave it for the censorship that we have for video games, movies, entertainment, Thank music. You. There's a censorship for that. Thank you. Let it be a censorship for this too. And leave it to the older mature children, or should I say the elderly. Thank you, Ms. Cheese. The adults, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. I appreciate you listening. Now we're, next we're going to hear from uh, Mark Linton, and after that it will be Tom Amon. I'm ready when you are. <laughs> I can't breathe. These were the final words of the man that the law enforcement warned not to resist. I'm grown and I realize the harm and suffocation. I can't imagine what hell it is for children to struggle for breath. I want the school board to step up to the plate. If you allow our children to be forced to mask up for class, you will have succumbed to government entities that have acted on bad information. Newport News citizens need for our leaders to follow our rules. If parents want to mask their children, then that decision should be a family matter, and God will judge the family. If we allow the government, which is supposed to be for the people, by the people, of the people, to mask our children, then God will judge us. Our governor has acted on bad information. And isn't this governor the one who would make the baby comfortable 
if he survives a botched abortion, comfortable while he discusses the fate of the child with the mother who's in pain from childbirth or in distress from pain medicine. I think the governor has lost his moral authority to think clearly on medical issues. Our CDC has only recommended that state laws dictate this mask mandate. Pardon me, but isn't this the same agency that recently wants to mandate that landlords cannot collect rent from tenants? They've changed from Center for Disease Control to Self-Appointed Center for Rent Control. I believe they've lost their focus and are now no longer qualified to dictate health policy. Law enforcement went on trial for murder when they ignored the man who couldn't breathe. This school board has the opportunity to do the right thing and push back on this government intrusion. Or you can fail the citizens, the children, and all that is right with our educational system. Will you do the right thing? Or will you be able to ignore the child who says, I can't breathe? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tom Amon, and next we'll have, after that we'll have Charles Fegan. Good evening, my name is Tom Amon, and I live in Newport News, Virginia. I am chairman of the Newport News Republican Party. I represent thousands of families with children in the public schools in the North, Central, and South districts. I also am a father of a child at Gildersleeve Middle School. It saddens me that we are once again having to deal with issues that have nothing to do with educating our children. Critical race theory, transgender policy, and masks? They do not benefit our children in any way. First off, CRT teaches that you're either a victim or an oppressor, and that the US is a systematically racist country. It forces children to view things through the lens of race, not content of character. This is fundamentally wrong. All of us know that our past has not been perfect, but I believe we are working towards a more perfect union and that the good, the bad, and the ugly need to be taught so that we can move forward towards that perfect union. Transgender policy being discussed pits parent against child and permits the school administration to keep secrets from the parents. This is not a healthy thing to do. It should be a family issue, not a school system issue. Allowing a child to decide what gender they feel they are that day poses issues for the rest of the children with regard to the use of bathrooms and locker rooms. It will also be a major distraction for teachers as they try to teach and at the same time worry about what proper pronoun to use to discuss something with a child. Please respect the parents should know if their child is having gender issues and they should be involved in any of these conversations. Last but not least, here we are again, political theater, several of you wearing masks, all of you vaccinated or have had the disease. You do not need to be wearing it. You should not be forcing our children to wearing it. It should be a parental decision and option. I believe you should as a protest vote, vote and say to the governor, we hear your mandate, we disagree with it. We're gonna empower our parents to make the decision for their children because they know their children best. Once again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. It is not an easy decision that you all are facing. Have a good evening. Amen. All right, Mr. Charles Vegan. Yes, how you doing? <clears throat> I'm a father of a 16 year old in the ninth grade when he just went to the 10th. And um, I, uh, I know that you guys stand on uh, the law of separation of church and state. Uh, one thing that came across my child while he was in virtual learning, um, we'll be just go straight to it. It says, um, he we received the uh, assignment. It says, please provide a response in the reply box. Be sure to provide three grammatically correct and spell check sentences and one correct 
rent one comment for full credit. He says, what would you do if someone told you at a young age as a prophecy that you would kill one parent and marry the other? How would you live your life? What would be different? Read at least one person's reply and leave a comment. Come to find out this is a Greek mythology story that's of, of, of written of a prophecy that they, they are trying to um, personalize my child while he's, he's on set foot inside the school. He's solely inside of my home. These stuff are going through my airways into my home. Okay, for one, Greek mythology is only a myth because certain people don't believe in it. But once you go ahead and take it up in college, it becomes Greek religion. Asking to kill parents, that, that, and, that, and, um, that um, insinuates homosexuality because you can choose which parents you wanna, wanna, want to marry. It's incest and it's pedophilia, okay? Looking for, looking for a child to find a way to normalize something that's so heinous because at the end it's saying uh, uh, respond to a, uh, a child, which my son did, right? I'm, uh, we are a blended family. I have uh, two by my, uh, my ex and two by my wife, and my oldest is, is the one that's by my, my ex. He responded to a, another person's um, um, answer. The little girl said, if I killed one of my parents, I, would be, I wouldn't be where I am today. But if I had killed one, it would be my mom because my dad do more for me and he is always there when I need him unlikely, unlike my mom who ain't never home. If I killed my mom and married my dad, that would be weird. I mean, very weird. But if I had did, but if I didn't have a choice, then how, that's how it would go. I would live my life distant because I wouldn't want to be around the family anymore or my dad after I've done killed my mom and my dad's wife. My wife is not his mother. And he replied one word that spoke volumes and said facts. Okay, Greek mythology doesn't have any place for a child because it's morally incorrect. And it's, it is breaching the church and state, the separation of church and state. Thank you, Mr. Pegan. Thank you. All right, at this time, I have exceeded uh, our 15 minute extension. And I do have three additional cards here. Uh, so in order to accommodate those cards, I would need a motion to extend, to further extend our public comment period. Is there a motion? Yes, there's a motion, uh, Mr. Chairman, to extend, how many do you have? Three. Okay, we'll extend for 15 minutes. All right, thank you. Uh, there's a motion, is there a second? A second. All right, seconded by Mr. Hunter, thank you. Is there any discussion? All right, there being none, uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Ely? Four. Harris? Four. Hunter? Four. Searles Law? Four. Amen? Four. Bess? Four. Brown? Four. Motion carries seven zero. All right. At this time, I do have three additional cards, and I'll ask uh, the clerk if there are any other cards that are passed up, please uh, pass those forward, and we'll, we'll continue our, our public comment period. Our next card I have is Sarah Kleinman, and after that will be Philip Guinness. Sir, Ms. Kleinman, yes, come on in. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Sarah Kleinman. I am the parent of a Hilton Elementary School student. Um, all of the parents I'm friends with are firm supporters of mask mandates and any social um, distancing or any other mitigation efforts we can put forth to keep our kids safe. Our children cannot be vaccinated yet, and we are all heartbroken and just freaking out about this school year and so worried about our kids being in school. So um, I'm not on Facebook. A lot of my friends are quieter and not on social media, but we are out there. We fully support the science. We fully support um, the governor's decision to do a mask mandate. Um, that being said, I didn't come here to talk about this, but also all the parents I do know and I'm friends with um, also support transgender and non-binary kids. And we want them to feel safe in school just as safe as cisgender kids and straight kids feel. Um, whether that means asking them their preferred pronoun or allowing them to use the bathroom of the gender they identify with, the vast majority of parents that I know support that. So thank you for keeping that in consideration. Even though we're not very vocal on Facebook and things like that, we are out there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kleinman. All right, Philip Ganest, and after Ms. G Mr. Ganest, then we'll have Steve Mackin. Steve McKean. Okay, 
Good evening, school board. Good evening. My name is Phil Janast. Um, I have two black children in my extended family. And um, I'm here to talk about uh, CRT. Uh, CRT has three basic tenets. There is no absolutes, only competitive narratives. And uh, lived experiences are more important than hard facts. I would hate to use that trying to go to the moon like we did in the 60s. Individuals are either oppressors or victims. And it is an immutable characteristics that is based off of your race. So how am I supposed to deal with my family if I follow this? I can't treat my kids the same. I'm supposed to treat my colored children differently than my white children. This is what CRT does. What this leads us to is America's basically systematically racist by its very core. So we're supposed to dismantle our entire country? Wait a minute, I'm, I'm scratching my head here. This was the land of the free. People would do extreme things to leave other countries to come to America because America was the land of the free. You had the opportunity to become what you wanted to become. It was about sweat and blood and effort, not your color. But CRT is bringing this all forward. Why? Because army ants are powerful because they unite as one when they have an enemy. You divide them and they're not a threat. CRT is designed on dividing us, making us not a unified body. That is what the globalists want because if we are united, they can't make a one world government. If they separate us, they can walk over us and change our entire way of life. Please keep this in mind. I understand there are a lot of politics here, but I prefer my country over division. Thank you. Mr. McKean. Hello, my name is Stephen McLean. The Constitution of the United, St United States was not written to restrain the citizens. However, it was written to restrain government. I'm speaking from my own heart, mind, and spirit. I'm not only standing for both my daughters, but I am standing for all the children in this city. This virus has been detrimental on too many levels. Although a real virus, we are also experiencing manufactured fear through media, government, and corporate entities. It is sad when anyone passes away, but we must face the facts. We have about 330 million people in this country approximately, and they're saying suppose it's 650,000 deaths from COVID. Where, where's the flu gone? Pneumonia. I have seen from multiple sources that the flu has practically disappeared from mask and social distancing. If we have 330 million people after 18 months, 650,000 deaths claimed from COVID, that means we still have about 329,350,000 people alive and breathing. And out of the 650,000, what are the ages, pre-existing conditions? Okay, so why, and there's so many recovering naturally. Is the vaccine, a vaccine that's 100% experimental now becoming mandatory? And it's not even FDA approved. If the vaccine should remain Optional, I'm fine with that. After 18 months and 99% survival rate, optional is understandable. Why does Governor Ralph Northam claim to be concerned about the children wearing masks, even though he was recorded stating he supported third trimester abortion, even up to delivery? So the four chambers of the heart are already developed, developed within the first trimester. So I mean, he must be a heartless man. I know a lot of people want to continue wearing these masks. All right. My fight here, I'm standing up against when flu and the new COVID strains come fall, winter. My stance is no lockdown as far as making mandatory, virtual learning mandatory. You can keep it. It was optional at the end of last year. Just keep it optional. I can already foresee this coming. Okay. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are tired of losing essential liberty over temporary safety. This 
birth, life, and death is a never-ending cycle with all people on the face of the earth. So in this time, we must keep our spirits high, reconnect with the source of all creation, and stop allowing these systems to treat us like human cattle. Herd immunity has failed. The experimental jab in a free country, if it's, if it's, it's experimental, if we're free, right? And this crony capitalism no longer allows alternative views, perspectives, uh, alternative treatments, and discourages anyone to think outside the box. Yet, and when you do, you get blocked, censored, and completely ostracized. So I, where I'm at, I, I get it. So the system, it's a, their way or the highway. I stand for liberty over lockdowns. I stand for things to be optional. Thank you, Mr. Vaccine Mr. optional, and so be it. Y'all have, have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. That was that was our last card. Madam Clerk, are there any additional cards? No, sir. All right. There being no additional cards at this time, then we will move to our consent agenda, item three. Uh, on the consent agenda, we have 3.01 minutes from the regular board meeting on June 15, 2021. 3.02 minutes from the work session on June 15, 2021. 3.03 minutes from the special meeting on June 15, 2021. 3.04 minutes from the organizational meeting on July 1st, 2021. 3.05 financial reports, revenue and expense, July 2021. 3.06 personnel report, 3.07 budget transfer, and 3.08 the 2021-22 school board norms and protocols. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Harris. <laughs> Any discussion? There being none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Ely? Four. Harris? Four. Hunter? Four. Searles Law? Four. Amon? Four. Best? Four. Brown? Four. Motion carries 7 0. All right. Thank you. And at this time, I believe, uh, Dr. Parker, we have uh, a personnel report to include some administrative appointees. At this time, I'm going to uh, ask for a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendation for some administrative appointees. Okay, um, I'm making a motion that the school board accept and approve the superintendent's personnel recommendations for the appointment of Christopher Sorensen as interim chief of finance and operations, Michelle Stevens as the supervisor of hearing impaired, visually impaired and speech language pathologists with special education and Anika Holden as assistant principal for Heritage High School. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Is there a second? A second. A second by Dr. Best. Any questions or discussion? All right. There being none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Ely? Four. Harris? Four. Hunter? Four. Searles Law? Four. Amon? Four. Best? Four. Brown? Four. Motion carries 7 0. All right. Congra thank you and congratulations. Dr. Parker, would you like to introduce your appointees? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce the three appointments for this evening um, uh, in, uh, in no necessary order, but uh, I'll introduce Mr. Christopher Sorensen as the Interim Chief of Finance and Operations. Would you stand, Mr. Sorensen? Uh, Mr. Sorensen has a bachelor's degree in urban studies and planning and a master's degree in public finance, both from Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, he started his career as a budget analyst with the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1988. I'm sorry to date you there. Um, he has worked as a financial analyst for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, senior budget analyst for the City of Richmond, budget division director for Hanover County, director of budget and risk management for Hanover County Public Schools, associate budget director and budget director of, uh, for Virginia Commonwealth University, assistant superintendent for business and finance with Chesterfield County Public Schools, and Chief Financial Officer for Henrico County Public Schools. Currently, Mr. Sorensen is retired, and he has given up his walks on the beach and, and strolling sunsets to come here and fill in a vacancy for a uh, future vacancy uh, as we um, um, uh, congratulate our current uh, Budget and Operations Administrator in her retirement. Um, we appreciate him for agreeing to help us continue to recruit for this position. As we look for a replacement, Mr. Sorensen, is, as you can tell, is well equipped to keep the school division financially sound and fiscally responsible as we transition to new leadership. We thank you for being here, Mr. Sorensen, and we'd like to welcome you to Newport News Public Schools. 
So, Mr. Sorensen, if the, um, I, uh, I think I met, we had lunch earlier today. I, I don't think you're accompanied this evening, but would you like to greet the board and the community? I'd love to. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parker, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Thank you for your confidence and uh, let me serve this position until it's, it's filled permanently. I look forward to working with staff and uh, getting back, working with students and improving students and working in school division. So, again, thank you for your confidence, and I look forward to serving. Thank you, sir. I look forward to work your leadership. Thank you. I'd also like to in introduce Michelle Stevens as the new supervisor for hearing impaired, visually impaired, and speech language pathologists with, special, with our Department of Special Education. Uh, Ms. Stevens has an educational specialist degree and a master's degree. Is she in the room there? Is she with us? There you go. Hi. <laughs> uh, master's degree in education with an emphasis in special education and a certificate of autism studies from Old Dominion University. She began her bachelor, her career, her bachelor's degree, she has a bachelor's degree of arts in psychology from Christopher Newport University, and she began her career as a special education teacher with Newport News Public Schools in 2012. During her career with the district, she has worked as a SPARC summer program administrator, response to intervention specialist, and currently as an instructional specialist. Congratulations, Ms. Stevens, on your, on your new appointment. And uh, we'd like to uh, give you a, first a round of applause, and then you can introduce any business to you. Thank you, and we look forward to your leadership, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'd also like to introduce our um, Annika Holden as the new assistant principal at Heritage High School. Ms. Holden earned her bachelor's degree in mathematics from Norfolk State University, woohoo, mm -hmm. and her master's degree in educational leadership from Old Dominion University. Uh, Ms. Holden began her career as a teacher with Newport News Public Schools in 2012. Uh, during um, her career with the district, she has also worked as an assistant testing coordinator lead math teacher, secondary instructional coach for mathematics, and a virtual jumpstart site coordinator. Congratulations, Ms. Holden, and thank you, and congratulations on your new appointment. And do you have it, as you introduce yourself, do you have anyone uh, joining us this evening? Oh, yes, I brought my husband and some of my friends. Um, please stand, friends. please stand, thank, yeah. there you go. Let's give them all a round of applause. And I see your husband's embarrassing you by filming you during this <laughs> moment. But we want to say welcome, and uh, we look forward to your leadership, and uh, thank you for, for pursuing to continue your career in, in Newport News Public Schools. Thank you. All right, congratulations. And Mr. Chairman, that concludes our, our, our appointments for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Parker, and congratulations again uh, to our appointees. All right, so now to action items. The next item on our agenda is Section 4. Uh, action item 4.01, a revision to the Equal e Educational Opportunities Policy. Dr. Parker, I believe we have a presentation before our vote. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we, uh, we asked that Mrs. Brooks come back to, uh, we've made some revision to the um, policy that's going before the board this evening for consideration. So we asked Ms. Brooks to come back to give an overview <coughs> of the uh, policy uh, in general for the board's consideration. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good evening. As Michelle pulls our presentation up, I'd like to say good evening, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Parker. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to come before you this evening to share a policy revision that we are proposing for your consideration. As you are aware, the policy committee typically begins each school year by revising our current policies or developing new ones to ensure that we meet the most recent state and federal mandates. So in keeping with this approach, we are, I would like to provide an overview of a policy revision that the state code is requiring school divisions to implement at the start of the school year. The revised policy and procedures that we are developing address the treatment of transgender students and reflect the eight components that we are legally bound to address in keeping with the state code, and I will share those with you in the next couple of slides. The eight areas that we must address through our policies and procedures pertain first to complying with applicable state and federal non-discrimination laws to ensure that our policies and procedures align with mandated legal requirements. Second, maintaining safe and supportive learning environments that are free from discrimination and harassment for all students. Third, 
preventing and responding to bullying and harassment, which as you know is an ongoing initiative with our youth development department. Fourth, maintaining student records as required by law. Fifth, identifying students to the extent possible that reflects the student's expressed identity. Six, protecting student privacy and confidentiality of sensitive information. Seven, import, enforcing gender neutral dress codes. And lastly, the state requires the school division to address student participation in gender specific school activities and events, as well as with the use of facilities. Now, when the General Assembly passed the legislation over a year ago regarding the treatment of transgender students, it also required the Department of Education to develop model policies and guidelines to assist school divisions in developing and updating their policies, and you've heard references to that document this evening. So to do this, the VDOE did convene a statewide committee to review policies and resources from across the country pertaining to the treatment of transgender students in public schools. So that committee worked for over eight months to prepare the model guidelines for the treatment of transgender students in Virginia public schools. And we use that document to update our policies and procedures. So before I go any further, I wanted to share our our working, um, working definition of transgender, which is a self-identifying term that describes a person who identifies with a gender that is different from their sex assigned at birth. Now, to comply with the legal requirements of the state code regarding the treatment of transgender students, we've updated our current policy on equal educational opportunities to add that the school division will not discriminate against any individuals based on their gender or gender identity. Our school division, as was mentioned earlier, is committed to providing educational programs and services to designed to meet the varying needs of our students to ensure that all students have safe, supportive, and inclusive school environments. Now next, the school division is developing implementing procedures that are consistent with the Code of Virginia requirements and are aligned to the Department of Education model policies document. The procedures will address the eight areas in the state code that I just mentioned to you, but in greater detail. The procedures posted online are an initial working draft that we will bring to a larger implementation committee to develop more thoroughly using best practices that will support our school division's work and will be consistent with the statutory requirements. Now I would like to briefly review each of the sections in the draft procedures that are aligned to the eight state code components and work to address the requirements of the law. The first section is on bullying, harassment, and discrimination. Our current school board policy on non-discrimination prohibits discri discrimination based on gender and gender identity. So we are working to review other related school board policies to ensure compliance with the state and federal laws. And we're also working on an equity policy that will be aligned to our strategic plan, which is Journey 2020. 25. Our second session addresses student privacy and confidentiality. All school staff must adhere to the legal standards of confidentiality relating to information about a student's transgender status, legal name, or gender assigned at birth. And in adhering to confidentiality, the school division staff will only disclose a student's status to other employees if it's of legitimate educational interest. Now regarding the identification of students, schools will allow students to use the name or pronoun that reflects their gender identity. And in working with school staff to support the student's gender identity, our major focus will be on ensuring that non-discriminatory practices are put in place. Next are school records. As requested, schools will use the student's assertive name and agenda on some school documents, such as student work. However, a student's name and a gender designation on official permanent records will be changed only if verified with the submission <coughs> of a legal document, such, a birth, such as a birth certificate, a passport, or a court order. 
Now, according to state legislation, student dress codes are to be gender neutral or without references to gender specific attire for classrooms, school related programs, activities and events. And our school leadership staff has already conformed our student dress codes in the students rights and responsibilities handbook to reflect the state requirements. Now regarding access to school programs, events, and activities, the school division will allow students to participate in a manner that is consistent with their gender identity. And in addition, activities that are regulated by the Virginia High School League, such as athletics, will comply with that organization's policies and rules. Next, access to facilities such as restrooms and locker rooms that correspond to a student's gender identity will be made available to all students and upon request, single use facilities will be made available to any student who seeks privacy. Now the last of the eight sections addresses professional development and training. All school mental health professionals will be trained annually on topics relating to LGBTQ plus students, including the safety and support of our students. Professional development for other school division staff will be provided in compliance with the Virginia Department of Education guidance and through the eight staff training modules that the Department of Education is developing and should be available to school divisions before um, the end of August. So in terms of next steps, we are requesting your approval of the revisions to the Educational Opportunity Opportunities Policy this evening. And next, as I mentioned earlier, we will form a committee to develop our school division's implementation plan and professional learning timeline related to the treatment of transgender students, our equity policy and cultural competency requirements, and our Title IX procedures. Now, the implementation committee will include our internal stakeholders that are representing departments such as curriculum development, school leadership, school counseling, uh, some of our mental health professionals, our plan services staff, to really develop thorough procedures using best practices and reasonable solutions that are consistent with our statutory requirements and really support our school division's work to ensure that all students have safe, supportive, and inclusive school environments. So this concludes my report to you this evening. I would like to thank Mr. Lynn Wallen, our Legal Services Director, and Dr. Jerron Ransom, our Youth Development Supervisor, for their work on our initial draft policies and procedures. But joining me this evening to respond to questions are some of the experts who are currently working in the areas that we will, that we will address in our procedures and that we will flesh out in the work that's upcoming in terms of developing those procedures that work best for the school division. They are Mrs. Linda Askew, our Student Support Supervisor, Mr. Wade Beverly, our Planned Services Executive Director, Dr. Shamika Jarrell, who is the Director of Equity Assessment and Strategic Operations, Mrs. Amy Jones, our Health and PE Supervisor, and again, Mr. Lynn Wallen. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burke. So I know that there are lots of questions and there's going to be significant discussion um, here. So. What I'd like to do first, uh, before we take questions, is, and as I mentioned uh, previously in my update memo, we'll take our questions one at a time, is I'd like to have a motion first, a main motion, and then we can go into our uh, discussion to address all, all questions. So is there a motion? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. There's a motion to approve the revised Equal Educational Opportunities Policy as presented. All right. You heard the motion. Is there a second? Second. All right, a second by Mr. Hunter. All right, so at this time, then now we'll go into discussion. And as I mentioned, we'll try to do this one at a time so we can bring the expert up to answer that question. Mm -hmm. And then the next board member will have an opportunity to ask their question. And we'll go around each one of us getting a chance to ask one question. And we'll continue until we exhaust discussion. All right, so I believe Mr. Ely had his hand up first. So go ahead, Mr. Ely. I just want to say thank you for the presentation and the research that it took to bring this information for uh, presented to us. <clears throat> um, kind of on a question, just a comment. I'm kind of disappointed at the Virginia Department of Education 
to be bringing up these issues to the school system and to the board while we're in the middle of a pandemic. Y'all have to take your hard earned time to discuss matters that's been around since I've been in school. And for us to have to go in this direction when, which, when we have kids that are failing, that are dropping out, who didn't get a great education, as other kids did during the pandemic to discuss um, a gender policy. There's over 52 genders. So what do we do address each gender? I believe God loves us all and he loves all our children. And I believe that in this situation of transgender, we need to do what's right by the person. And I believe God created male as male, female as female. And if, like when I, I graduated school in 2002, Mitchell High School, we had transgenders in there. They went about their way. Nobody bothered them. They went to the bathroom. But just to, this whole, this whole um, hype around this, I think is really not necessary while we're in the middle of a pandemic. My focus is not on this. I mean, if, if we have transgender, we need to treat all kids fairly, whether they're transgender, bi-gender, ex-gender, k-gender, whatever gender they are, all children need to be treated fairly and given the same same um, equal across the board. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be pointing out these different type of genders. What if we've got another another group come up and say, okay, well, I'm trying, um, um, by gender. So we got to go through this again. You know, I just think the direction is being, and I'm very, and it's not you, it's not the board. It's very, it's sad that Virginia Department of Education is doing this when we, we're in a pandemic, you know? So I'm just, I thank you for your presentation. I just feel like this is not the appropriate time to, to be even dealing with this. I know we're doing with the state, the state mandate, but I believe God loves us all. I believe he created guys, guys, girls, girls. If you're a male, go to the male bathroom. If you're female, go to the female bathroom. And if you are anything else that you identify, you can go to the nurse's bathroom. Uh, so audience, please, please don't respond to the board members at this, at this time. This is our uh, time for our discussion. All right, thank you, Mr. Ely. Uh, Ms. Amy, do you have a question? Um, I'm sure I'll have several questions and comments, but um, I, if I could start with um, a couple questions on the process, uh, because you know we're looking at very limited proposed changes to a policy, but very significant procedures for a specific um, group that we don't have that level um, of procedures for any other group. And I, I certainly have my own. I certainly have legal and practical considerations, and I'll probably share those the next time we go around but um, a couple questions just to sort of clarify where we are procedurally serving on the policy and procedures committee my experience typically has been that we might recommend a policy change together with some drafts on a procedure so we look at them holistically Correct. at this point we're looking at minor policy change but there's going to be some significant procedures and we need to flush those out it's enough of a heart issue for our community I'm very concerned about jumping the gun. And if our standard procedure is to flush everything out, um, why are we rushing at this point? Have we had other examples where we have been so limited on what the procedures are going to be and after we pass a policy? And are there any negative impacts if we don't? To my knowledge, there aren't. By not, there, aren't there aren't financial or other impacts. So I guess my question is, how does this compare with what we have done in the past? And just to confirm, we're not aware of significant negative impacts if we choose to focus on education in the pandemic at this point. Mrs. Zayman, is that a question or a statement? Um, probably a little bit of both. But this is a little bit outside our usual process, correct? We usually have a flushed out procedure. Right. And this, given the time period, we were really waiting to get the final guidelines and to really pull together once the board approved a procedure to work on, approved a policy, excuse me, to work on the procedure. So there is still work in place. And as you know, the, the procedures that we have now truly reflect 
the guidelines and we really want as we said to flesh through those and to pull together people who can really help us do that work so that we will be ready for the start of school in terms of implementing these guidelines so that's why we're proposing a larger committee to bring some of the staff people who are with us this evening to work to do that work and some of it has already been done because we've been working on these issues for years so they're bringing that experience to this particular item, agenda item this evening. So we will need more time and we want to do a thorough job in, in doing that for our students and staff. And typically, am I correct, the board approves policy, but the board does not approve procedures. Correct. So we're looking at a policy that we don't know what the procedure's gonna be. All right, I think um, in terms of in terms of what the procedure will be, you have guidance in, in the law that of the eight, eight areas that we have to address and the model policies give you guidance on how to address those those eight areas. Um, you have a draft procedure in your in your that was provided that um, that shows the guidance on those eight specific areas. Now, there's areas that um, we're prepared to respond to tonight in terms of restroom use, those types of things. How do you get from the from the legal and the and the the law into practical application? And that's where where we have to make sure we're legally sufficient in those areas because you can also cause problems when you think you're helping people. Um, so with that being said, we have always provided students access to, to alternative restrooms uh, since I've been in public education. We've had kids using the nurse's restroom. We've had kids using uh, the clinic restroom. We've had kids going to the mm -hmm. um, alternate locations to change for, for various reasons, depending on what they, that may be. Now we have a law that, that's come forward that says that, hey, these kid, uh, kids have a choice and they, they, they actually have to, we cannot make them go, but we still will provide choice. So while the Virginia BDOE developed procedures that are very generic in purpose, they are setting us on a track. Now we have to determine what is um, applicable and practical. We will still provide choice and, and that our building leaders work with students who may not be, we're making an assumption that, that, that transgender children will, will want to go to the boys' restroom or girls' restroom. Many of them choose to go to the nurse, to the clinic, the, to, to, to other places, and we have always provided that access since, 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 since I can remember. I mean, we've always provided, had a, student, a few students who went to the nurse's room, had passes to go to special locations to, for restroom breaks or a change of clothing. We have to make sure we put the practical in our processes to ensure that, that we're doing that. We still have to deal with it, folks. It's not going away. Mm -hmm. so, um, so with that being said, now that we have to make sure we're doing it in a non-discriminatory way. Um, the other thing that we, um, in our procedures that we really need to address is the whole, is the big issue of parent notification. We still can ask a student, would you like us to help you or, and, um, to facilitate a meeting with your parent or to help you communicate with your parent this choice that you're making. There's nothing illegal about that. But the video guidelines say that we can't mandate it, we can't make it happen, we can't do those things that's not best practice because there may be fear there. There may be fear of repercussion from the parent. There may be some parents who may handle it a different way. So we have to make sure we put procedure in place to address things that are come to us naturally anyway. We deal with these issues all the time in our schools is not, you know, it's it, it's our mental health professionals deal with deal with these personal issues all the time and facilitate these discussions all of the time with students. Now there's just mandated actions that we may or may not be able to do, and there are legal requirements that we have to make sure we we meet. So with that being said, Mrs. Amon, yes, we have eight guidelines we have to meet in our standard procedures. We've provided a draft of that document, um, and we still need to make sure we put the rational common sense and practical application into the things that we do to make sure that students and parents are comfortable moving forward with any with any legal requirements that we have in place. Thank you, and other questions? Other board members? Other question, yes, Dr. Best. Go ahead. Can you just expound on what Dr. Parker said about the parent notification? Like, where is it right now? Can you expound on that just a little bit? Mrs. S, you are an expert. Thank yes. you. Well, I'd like to first send greetings to the board and for allowing me the opportunity to speak. When we do have conversations with parents, we do have ways of communicating with parents, not exactly telling them the situation that has occurred, 
but letting them know that a conversation may need to be held with their child to find out what their needs are, what their concerns are, what their issues are. We also help children to have those conversations with their parents so that they don't feel that they are alone in this process of identifying who they are as a person. So we support them fully whenever they need to speak with their parent. We also, again, have ways of conversing with parents to let them know they may need to have a conversation with their child. So I hope I answered your question. You did, can I ask you? Oh, well, let's, let's, uh, oh, let's go around and see uh, if other board members have a first question. Additional questions at this time. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a, a, a one question about curriculum. Okay. Uh, so I recall that at thank our- Thank you. Thank you. So I recall that at our planning retreat, um, we did get a, a primer on the gender spectrum uh, that as it was as it was briefed and so the question there in terms of the procedures is you know adopting this policy this evening going to necessitate changes to either our um, sex education curriculum or our biology curriculum in terms of teaching uh, students that there's a gender spectrum so as you know thank you greetings board um, thank you for allowing me to speak as you know the standards of accreditation drive um, require us to teach the standards of learning in our Virginia schools there will be changes that occur to our curriculum and they'll all be driven by those SOLs. So as those standards change, um, so will our curriculum and our instruction around it. Regarding family life, um, there have been, in 2020, there was a mandate uh, that did create some changes to the SOLs. And so in ninth grade, there is a um, SOL 9.3 that does address uh, gender identity, um, sexual orientation, gender expression. Thank you. Yeah, so Madam Vice Chair, please go ahead. Sure, I have a question um, for uh, training for teachers. Um, so as I can imagine, with all that teachers are having to uh, do on their plate, and them wanting to do things well, what kind of support um, for professional development will be in place um, for teachers? Good evening, Chairperson Brown, Chair, uh, Vice Chair Squirrels Law School Board, and Dr. Parker. Um, our professional learning plan, um, once, uh, if and when the policy is approved and the procedures are developed, we'll be working with our professional learning department, Mrs. Angela Rett to identify the dates and provide synchronous and asynchronous opportunities for policy and specific pro professional learning about implementation of procedures um, for our school division prior to September 8th. A addendum to that. Oh, addendum question to <laughs> addendum So it's the same question. Same question, saying, question yes. basically. Okay. I call it a dovetail. <laughs> <laughs> Who will be um, designing that curriculum for, for the teachers? Um, so the, the information modules. will, the mod, the, if you're speaking specifically regarding the modules, regarding the eight things that are listed in the statutory guidance, we will be receiving guidance from the Virginia Department of Education which on what will be included. And it could be a module similar to what we do with restraint and seclusion or with child abuse or with technology. So there are modules that are developed for um, school divisions to use. Um, in terms of providing professional development prior to the September 8th on the implementation of Newport News' specific procedures, that information would come from our team and we would rely on the expertise of um, folks like Mrs. Askew and Amy Jones um, and myself and Dr. Ransom and um, some of our members of HR team to develop out what that would look like to ensure that using research and adult learning theory that we put things in place so teachers are clear and understand what this means for our school division. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Miss Mr. Harris, you? No, I don't no, have no question, no question at this time. All right, then uh, I believe that Miss Amon had a second question. I don't have a question. I have more of a comment. Okay. So, I mean, okay. there no um, Why don't we, yes, yeah, so, so why don't we continue through, through with our questions, then we'll have a comment period uh, right at the end of this before we vote. So uh, additional questions? Dr. Best. Just I'll get back to the parent um, again. Where do you see, or I've been trying to, you know, read up as far as what other divisions are doing or have done, and I really haven't seen this yet, but 
maybe you have because you have more experience with it. Where do you see it going if you have a transgender student and they have informed you that my parents, absolutely not, you cannot tell them I'm going to get a beating, da da da. da. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I ask that because I'm wondering about the position it puts teachers in and, and other school personnel. But so just if you can, you may can't. Like, yes, ma'am. If there is concern about the safety of a child, we are all mandated reporters. And therefore, whether or not we know it's a valid concern, we would have to report that to Child Protective Services. They would investigate and determine the validity of the report. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Other questions? All right. Um, I'm going to ask the, I, I would like to ask a, a question. There's the legal question. It's probably for Mr. Wallen. Uh, so presuming the, the this requirement from the VDOE, what is the penalty for not enacting, uh, what, for, what's the penalty for not enacting this policy this evening uh, not and, and waiting to develop procedures uh, at a later time? Because as was as has been mentioned, uh, there is a po there is a possibility that we would that we could see fully developed procedures and then revisit this at a later time. What is the what is the legal implications for doing that? As I understand it, the attorney general has opined that there aren't any financial direct financial implications for a failure to adopt the a policy consistent with the requirements by, of state law. It does seem to me that the failure to adopt a policy when the General Assembly has dictated that it be uh, adopted could trigger an action for an injunction, which would, the purpose of that would be to force the school division to adopt something. And if the school division didn't adopt that, then you'd have the, the implication of um, um, court sanctions not necessarily money from from the uh, VDOE or the state, but court sanctions. So I think the, the answer is that my advice, as I've indicated to you before, is that the General Assembly in a statute has directed boards to adopt the policy. They've said that the policy should be implemented by the start of this school year. And so it would be unwise to not follow the state law and I, I don't know of any uh, justification, substantial justification for failure to do that. Thank you. Mr. Hunter. Uh, so I'll do the follow up on uh, the, Mr. Chairman. So we um, don't adopt tonight, okay? Or, and then we have students in. We don't have anything in place. And we're, we have an incident with a teacher and a student or a family. Then what is the issue? Right, that we don't have a policy in place. My concern would be, and this is a little speculative, but my concern would be that having been directed to create a, a specific policy that addresses non-discrimination against transgender students, that the failure to do that might trigger uh, the, an argument that w we were intentionally discriminating against transgender students. Uh, I don't know that that would be a successful allegation. I think someone w would tr might try to make it because we are failing to do something that the General Assembly dictated and it's described as an anti-discrimination step. So I would, I would be concerned that we would be putting the school division in a, a, a difficult position based on a discrimination lawsuit. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Whalen. Uh, Mr. Whalen, uh, other questions from board members? All right, I'm going to, then I'm going to ask another question. <laughs> uh, and this is, a, this is a regards to the, going back to the parental notification. So the procedure as it stands, as, it, as written today, uh, a child, and the question is a child um, in elementary school, a child as young as seven years old, could come to school, declare uh, a new gender identity, and the parent, and there's, there's a circumstance where the parent would not be notified. Is that, is that true right now? From reading the policy 
outlined in the Virginia Department of Education, it does state that we do not have to notify the parent. However, as a mental health professional, we would most likely encourage the child to have that conversation with their parent and we would support that child in having that conversation. Can I just add also that the EDOE policy does, the model policy, mm -hmm. does state that um, school division shall not disclose um, um, the, the gender identity of the mm -hmm. student. So it's not a, we may not, we know it's a shall. It says you shall not to parents. And, the, and therein lies the, um, the crux of this discussion, you have to, um, first of all, we have mental health professionals in our, in our school division. I've had this conversation um, um, with, with several members of our board that uh, there's, there just seems to be that piece missing that we have the supports necessary, and we always have had the supports necessary Absolutely. to support the emotional, social emotional um, needs of our students. So we would encourage any adult in our school to have that student <coughs> speak to our school counselors our school socials, our clinically licensed social workers, and therein would lie the encouragement to work that student through a very, a very important decision that they're that they may in their mind be thinking that is a is the decision that they have made, um, and part of that would be involve encouraging the student to speak to their parent, and whether the parent would be supportive of that conversation. Um, but we are mandated reporters. We have to work in the, in the safety of students under a variety of situations. There are a lot of circumstances where we may feel a student may be in jeopardy with their, with their um, due to parent involvement. And we have to make sure we manage that carefully. And no, I don't believe our teachers are the ones to have that, com have that conversation and that level of support. I believe our mental health professionals in our schools are the ones to have that support. So while we have a, a model guidance from the Virginia Department of Education, the common sense and educator in me tells me that we have to rely on individuals in our school division who are trained um, to support the social emotional needs of our students and understand the value of parent support. Um, and that's where we have to make sure that we're moving forward in a, in a logical and realistic way. Um, because sometimes when things are written a certain way and you see, you see it in, in black and white, it's not, it doesn't play out in, in a normal school setting or the appropriate way. Um, so we would, we would highly, definitely um, support a student speaking to their parent and supporting that conversation um, and we would also understand and respect that if a student is um, afraid or uncomfortable with that with uh, with that that level of engagement, we'll have to find other ways to maybe work with them and support their their um, their decision um, in our school settings. We have to deal with these matters. Eventually, we deal with them already, so it's not that this policy is going to create it. The, the, these are issues that we are dealing with, and we have to make sure that we are not discriminatory in our practices with dealing with these issues now that come before us and we are currently de um, dealing with and have dealt with in the past. And I've mentioned to several board members here, and I'll mention it publicly as a principal, I told a young man who wore a skirt to school one day not to wear that skirt to school anymore. And, um, and I, I, I still look back, it was over 10, 15 years ago. And, um, and I look at that young man was maybe making his gender reveal. And I, I was not, it, it, from me, I was looking at it from a disciplinary and a disruption standpoint. Um, and I told, and I just, I made that comment. Do not dress like that again in school. Do not come back to school in that, in that, in that, in that outfit. Now I will say the skirt was a little short, but, <laughs> but it was, but it was still, um, in my mind, inappropriate. And here I am, 15 years later, and I'm understanding that I possibly discriminated against a student uh, back in the day when I was a principal um, because of, there was no policy and there was no procedure. And uh, that's the point that I think we have to really co continue to to make a point, and I do, I have my own opinions, but as a superintendent, I also have to understand that we have to be a school division that have a high standard, has a very high standard for non-discriminatory practices, and we need to make sure we find those solutions. Thank you. If there are no additional questions, then at this time, then we will go ahead and do comments. And uh, so I'll call you on you in no particular order. So I'll just uh, call on uh, uh, Mr. Harris, do you have any comments? I have no comment, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And, uh, uh, Ms. Amon, you uh, mentioned you had uh, comments earlier. Do you sure. want to make a comment yeah. at this time, please? I can say, sure. Um, and just some general comments, and uh, I guess one of the benefits of being up here, we may not have to be within three minutes, but we'll see. Um, I'll do my best. Um, but as I understand it, Newport News is already 
a desirable, desirable district sometimes for transgender students. We've had, I think, a Daily Press article written in the past about students coming here from other districts where they didn't feel um, was as positive an environment for them. Um, and so I think we're doing something right, absolutely. Um, my big concerns here are the contents of the policy, which, well, which will lead to the proposed procedures. You know, although we're looking at what's a seemingly innocuous policy, to me this is the first time I've seen a policy without a fleshed out procedure. And if we are, you know, if we are legally to have to adopt uh, in line with the model policy, I have some serious practical and legal concerns with the model policy. I don't know that I could support a policy or procedure in line with that at any time. Um, so I consider my vote on the policy as minimal as the language is effectively to be a vote on the proposed procedures because they will come with or without our vote if we um, adopt this policy. Um, so just to articulate some of my concerns, um, one, both the legislature and the Virginia Department of Education issued these provisions as a model policy, not as a model procedure, meaning I think they believe school boards should consider them and vote on them or adopt them as specifically as the model policy is. Um, so I've got to consider not just the policy, uh, but also the procedure, uh, even though we've kind of looked at separating them. Um, I, think, I think our vote needs to be considered a vote on both. And I do have serious legal and practical concerns with the proposed procedures to be able to say we were in compliance with the model policy. Um, I would... I would disagree. I, you know, I think there's some very. I don't think this was necessarily well thought out <laughs> through the Virginia Department of Education when they came up with this. Um, you know, parents' rights, as we've heard several times, um, the model policy or procedures would require school staff to use the name and pronoun that corresponds to a student's gender identity at the request of a student or parent. So that permits the school to hide from the parents their children's gender identity by referring to students one way at school and another to parents. Um, and as we were informed, it also says in concerning situations, the school shall not notify the parents. And I think this oversteps, and I think it violates parents' fundamental rights to make decisions concerning the upbringing, education, and care of their children, and that's codified in the Virginia statutes too. We already have a system in place that seems to be working well. If there are complaints or concerns, I'm not aware of them. If we get to a situation where we can't notify the parent or the child tells us not to their concern for their safety, we already have to, especially the mental health professionals, notify Child Protective Services. So there is a, there is a mechanism in place, and I'm not okay with putting the, the school division in a situation where the parents may feel like we're not being honest with them and we're not fully involving them in their child's decision in these situations. Um, I'm very concerned about the proposed modules. We haven't seen them, we don't know what's in them. Um, as we heard on our general, um, our general standards of learning, there's, there's one day or one class in ninth grade that deals with gender. And actually that was the one class I got comments about from constituents last year. Uh, video sent to me of the class that raised significant concern and you know family life is one students can opt in or out of they can opt out of a particular day if they look through the curriculum and the division shall provide other things for them to do for that class period we're looking at putting out eight modules of teaching to staff and teachers on this we don't know what it's going to be I could see the content of the family life and I'm thinking eight sessions I think that can go well beyond just non-discrimination and treating others with respect and well into very detailed explanation of gender expansive ideology. I think that still remains con <coughs> controversial. I don't think it's um, necessarily settled and it is at odds with many of the major face in our community. You know, we're not willing to impose it on our students. Why are we unknowingly going to adopt this that we have to impose on our teachers and staff? I think that may raise constitutional concerns with students, staff, and teachers, um, their religious beliefs and their free exercise of religion. Um, and I also have very practical and I pro also legal concerns with regard to human resources. As it, it was brought up, the model policy requires school staff to use a desired name and pronoun without any substantiating, substantiating evidence. Um, 
there could be claims or complaints of discrimination or harassment that is based on an individual's actual or perceived identity, gender identity. But the explanation around the model policy explains gender is fluid. It could vary with time. Schools have to require more than a casual declaration of gender identity, but not substantiating evidence. These are such uncertain standards. I don't know any HR department that could implement it without risking significant complaints. So I can't imagine implementing it. Um, and then the model policy also says we'll follow the Virginia High School League for, um, for athletic teams. We don't know what they're going to do. I think that should be a school board decision. I don't know that we should blindly agree to it. I think we would need to have a conversation if they came out to let transgender females play on women's teams. That's a conversation that needs to be had. I'm not sure the science has settled that that, um, I don't think that would be appropriate. And I think that prevents women and women's sports team from having equal opportunity to college scholarships and other opportunities. So I would want the board to not blindly agree to that in this model policy, but that would be something we'd have to have a very open and honest public discussion and debate on. So those are my concerns. I don't think they'll ever be resolved in a way that will follow the model policy. So that's kind of where I stand on the policies and procedures. All right, thank you, Ms. Amon. Uh, uh, Dr. Bess. Um, thank you. I um, concur with Ms. Amon regarding the way that the policy came about because normally we do the uh, with the way the procedures normally we do the policy and then the procedures are flushed out so I concur with that I also um, just would like to commend the school personnel that have worked with the um, procedure and and board members and, and everyone that came out and spoke because this is the kind of issue that we need to be absolutely transparent about no matter what side of the fence that we um, are on. So I'm just gonna share with you um, my experience. I, um, my background is a former school counselor as well. And just like Dr. Parker, I had some experience with um, transgender, possibly transgender um, students. And, and two in particular that stick in mind, and this was before we had official training on it, just like he said um, as well. But I had a first grader and she was born a girl, but her parents said ever since she could talk, she said she was a boy. And so they asked me to speak with her. And when they asked me to speak with her, they did not tell me what it was about. They, they just said, we just want you to talk with her and make sure everything is okay. And of course I did. I just wanted to make sure she was a happy, well-rounded child and she appeared to be exactly that but came from a two-parent family and so uh, uh, the, i shared that with the parents she asked me could i meet with the child again so i actually ended up meeting with the child twice but i wasn't pursuing anything because i didn't know um you know any well i'm sorry i could because i didn't know anything at that time she didn't tell me about what the problem was until after i met with the child the second time so when i talked with the teachers well the teacher everything was fine and when the parent shared it with me, and when I talked with the teacher after that, the teacher said that she knew that the child said she was a little boy and the child would tell the teacher. She didn't tell the other kids, but she would tell the teacher. Um, at that time, the teacher said she, um, the only thing she that kind of stood out about her was that free time or recess, she would always gravitate towards the boys. And so that's my experience with that child. I just, just kind of left it like that, but no one in the child's life made it a big deal i didn't make it a big deal her teacher and she had a wonderful year for that year i don't know where that child um, is now so when i talk about this for me faces come to mind especially these two experiences so the second one was with a fifth grade boy who shared with me and they didn't use the term transgender they said that they thought they were um, a girl um, as well, but they went on to share with me, the child appeared to be very, very sad all the time. And so the teacher made a referral for the child to see the counselor. And the child shared with me that they um, thought they were a girl and they wanted to be a girl. Th those were their words as well. They wanted to be a girl and that um, they could not talk about it with anybody. And they said, and the child said, when I talked about it with my mother, she just cut it off and, and, and shut me, you know, shut me down. And the child, the child also said I was afraid that I was going to get, she was going to whip me. 
Um, but the mother also shared that with the, she evidently suspected something, even though they couldn't have a full conversation because she shared it with the people at her church. And so the mother had some of the male members to talk with him in a very kind of strong way that was, you know, um, the way the child described it, 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 it made them feel bad and it was kind of pressuring him. And he just constantly looked very, very sad. And I was very concerned that this child was going to harm themselves. So I tried to, and the child just absolutely forbid me from telling the parent, you know, what was kind of going on. But like I said, I, I'm just being totally honest with you. I didn't have any official training. So I shared with the parent, not directly, but I was trying to go there to see if she would be open with the conversation. And she knew where I was going and, and it was absolutely not. And it was just absolutely not. But my, so it kind of, it kind of just kind of left it alone. And I just let the child know I was a safe haven when they would come and talk with me. We loved him, the teachers loved him, that type of thing. And my concern about this child, I'll still see this child every time to this day, they're still in Newport Public Schools. And I just breathe a sigh of relief that they're still alive because they're really struggling and going through um, a lot because of family um, circumstances. So that it, that comes to mind with me when I'm when I'm thinking about this. I have two faces that I take into consideration as well, and I just want to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Best. All right, Mr. Ely. I just want to um, say that. <clears throat> Newport News has always been a school district that showed love, compassion, and equal opportunity for all kids. Um, never even having transgender and different um, gender in our school, everyone always treated them fairly. I don't know why we at a point now where we have to separate different classes of people. What's the difference in little Michael who's home, who might be homeless, who's getting bullied in school? Are we going to treat him a certain kind of way? So I just feel like Newport News does a very great job of treating all kids equally. And I think that as long as we keep on our core values that we have as a school division, we'll be fine. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ely. Ms. Earl's Law, would you like to make a comment? Um, uh, yes. My constituents... Um almost equally contacted me regarding this issue. Um, I think what I heard a lot of today that worries me or brings me to pause is as Dr. Parker said, the policy doesn't create the concern. And if we are not prepared to deal with the concern, then we're doing our students a disservice there. And um, having unequipped teachers, you know, unfortunately, as, you know, Dr. Parker shared and Dr. Beth shared, they were unequipped during those times to be able to uh, successfully care for students who came to them. Uh, what is our role as a school division? Is it to um, try to make a safe place for all children to learn, as someone said, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And it is. But we also, I think, do clearly know that you don't get to that if you have other issues. And that becomes our challenge here. Um, I have to agree uh, with um, Ms. Amon that I would really like to see the policy and the procedure be able to come as one. It's unfortunate that the legislation did it to us this way. It says that you need to have something in place by the beginning of, of school. That being said, we've been in that situation before and I think making our concerns known regarding procedure I really have confidence in in this administration as um, how they've responded in the past and implemented procedure and process in in full earnest with the support and the 
goal of educating our students at the heart of all that they do. I do not believe that Dr. Parker and his team are going to take the policy that we vote on today and use it for bad for our students. We have a ton of policies that could be interpreted many ways. And Newport News um, Public Schools interprets those policies such that it takes the care and consideration uh, into great, great concern for our students, for our students who are going to come through our doors, they need to realize that they, they matter. And so I'm very happy that the community came out today to speak on both sides of this, because as a community, that's what we need to do for our, our students, is we need to be able to be voices and they need to be able to see and hear us being concerned about um, those things that that concern them so this is a hard one this is a very hard one it's a little bit of stepping out on faith um, but i've seen newport news public schools do things right and that was well before i was on this board so those are my comments all right thank you mr Ozal. mr hunter uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, we've heard uh, from lots of folks this evening, and um, we, we even have a lawyer on our school board, so she gave us a, a very detail of some of our concerns. One of my biggest concerns is really with the elementary school level and, and not telling the parents and things that sort give me some unrest. However, I have worked with, I do live with educators at the elementary school level and um, we, we, our goal, our jobs here at the school board is really to first to ensure the safety of our kids, number one. That, that's best number one. Number two is to ensure that our, each and every child gets the best education they possibly can get here. And be have equitable. Don't care what your race, creed, color, sexual orientation. We're, we're not doctors. We're not doctors, that's not our job. We were elected here by our constituents to ensure that we have a safe place and that each and every child, even though you may not like all the things that's gonna be in this policy, I, I cringe at them myself, but it's a mandate. I'm quite sure each one of us on this board, if we didn't have to vote, we wouldn't, not right now. If we can pick and choose some of those things out, we would, but we can't, we, we can't. And there are kids out there that are, students out there that are suffering. We just don't know about it. I read the article months ago that many students are in Newport News Public Schools because of our acceptance of their identity. That, that's acceptance of their identity. There, don't make money get, but there are many times ago that as a black man, I couldn't even vote, even though they say I was a man. That was not in my time. And so I know, I know, I know this is a hard decision for us, but we must pass, you know, a policy. Uh, our vice chair says it, we, I must, must we must rely on our superintendent and his senior staff and all the other staff that we have the counselors and the psychiatrists all those within our school system to ensure that when there is an issue that comes up that we handle it properly and there when i was chairman of the board so i know we on the previous employment i had one of the parents called me. I thought it was a work-related job or question. She says, my daughter is now a boy. What is Newport News System gonna do? She made a phone call. Three weeks later, she came to me and says, oh, Gary, what a wonderful school district. Have heard, haven't heard anything. But I know that child probably graduated this year or last year. So sometimes we make 
big issues that may not be a big issue. I think that because we're already handling it here. We are handling it. But our job is not to discriminate against anyone at all. I mean, we're here to ensure the safety and, you know, the well-being and kids get educated. We don't want kids to be alone. I don't want no Columbine here. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, don't, I don't want it to grow into that. I want, you know, there's other ramifications. Sometimes, you know, you have to look past the trees to see the whole forest. And so, yeah, we're looking at one or two, each one of us are probably looking at one or two different things that we don't like in this policy. But I believe that we have the knowledge, the personnel staff here to make sure that when a issue comes up that we handle it properly. If not, I wouldn't be on the school board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Mr. Hunter. All right, I'll, I'll try to be brief, because um, as, as all of you, I've got some things that, that I would like to say as well. And normally I try not to speak my opinion, uh, but you know, tonight on an issue like this, I do feel compelled to, to say something. Um, before I was a school board member, I was a father first. And it was as a, as a father that really, you know, made me think about being a board member and one of the things that we talk about, we have a policy that says that parents are essential and that the school division views uh, parents as being the primary educators of their children when it comes to their gender and their sexual orientation, their sexual identity. So to have a policy that contradicts that, I think that tonight what we'd be doing if we you know, adopted this policy is we would have to throw that other policy out as well because those two things you know, are in conflict with one another. Uh, parents can't be essential, and then, you're, and then we have a, a set of procedures that says that we're not going to uh, honor the, the rights of parents. Um, those two things uh, can't be true. And then, of course, you know, before I was a father, I was a Christian, and you all, you all know me. Sometimes you make jokes and make fun of me for being a very religious you know, guy. Uh, but you know, as, as also you know, very religious, I've been very private, right? We, we talk a lot about, or I practice not trying to impose my religious beliefs on anyone else, right? But this policy and this procedure imposes a set of beliefs on everyone. It says, it, it says that gender is a spectrum, which, I, hey, I'm, I am as uh, understanding and empathetic with everyone and, and, and always respect other people's beliefs. I don't have, as a religious person, I don't believe that. And then therefore, I don't want that imposed upon me and my family and other children to have to believe that. We, and, and we know, we heard tonight that, you know, this, uh, this notion, what, what follows the adoption of, a, of, of believing that gender is a spectrum, then it moves into our curriculum, which right now, as, as, as family life dictates, you know, kids can opt out of, but if we adopt it as a policy as non-discrimination, it's going to permeate into our curriculum as being required that everyone has to believe this. And if you don't, then you are a bigot or you're discriminating. And I don't, I can't abide by the notion that because I have a different belief that I'm a bigot. I have a different belief and I respect your right to have a different belief as well. And, and then just, you know, developmentally, uh, you know, my concern, as always, our mission is, is, is children. You know, I'm, I, I know that there's a lot of scientific thought and discussion. I'm not sure that a child is really in a position to decide what their gender is when they're a child. And I've always been of the opinion, hey, it, my belief is always, hey, do what you do what you will. And our job is let's let's get them to be adults and they can make whatever decisions they want to make and, and, and make their choices. So the notion of a child being a child making that decision on their own and you know then then being then being on their own and, and the parent us being between the parents and them, it just that's that's a mess that that I don't, it's a, it's a personally a mess that I don't want. And that's, you know, that's, and that's, you know, of course, again, that's just me. The other thing that can, you know, that concerns me in terms of the procedure as written today, a child can make infinite changes to their gender. So they come in one week, I feel like a boy. Next week, I feel like a girl. Next week, I feel non-binary. Next week, I feel, feel this. Now, I did, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make a cartoon or trying to say that people will do that, but I'm saying the procedure as written allows for that. And that's potentially chaos. There has to be changes to student records and all that every time this, this child says that. And they can 
theoretically come in and say, don't tell my parents, I've changed this and I've changed my name and, and, and then there's gonna be an impact on their student records. And just, you know, it's a, it's a you know, as Ms. Amon pointed out, I think it's a, a nightmare to try to, to manage. So we are, as board members, we are in a position to make a decision. Uh, yes, the General Assembly passed a law. They passed a bad law, in my, in my opinion. Um, but their law required us to take a vote, which is what we're about to do tonight. Okay? So the fact that, they, we, the fact that we have to take a vote means it does fall to us. And I don't believe that we can actually defer this responsibility by saying, well, the General Assembly made me do it. When the General Assembly, so it's one thing I, I very much believe in, in following the law, so I don't want people to uh, take me as a hypocrite because I talk about following the law all the time. When the law violates the Constitution, then it's a bad law. Okay, in this case, this law violates the Constitution. And we're talking about that, well, if we had more time, we develop some different procedures, we'd have something tailored to Newport News. There's nothing stopping us from doing that. If we voted this down tonight, there's nothing stopping us from next month, after that, developing a set of, developing a set of procedures, doing what we normally do, develop some procedures, put it out there to the public, have some focus groups, let the public look at it, vet it, come back and say, hey, here's our procedures that are tailored to Newport News Public Schools and adopt that. As we've, as we've heard tonight, um, even, even, and, I, and I would say this, even if the liability for our school division was at a significant level, which I, I believe it's not, I'd still vote against this. Um, and so that's, that's my comment and that's my, that's my perspective. So at, at this time now, I'll just ask, um, we have the main motion. Uh, and I said I, I said it because I said I would um, uh, you know, offer up this opportunity. Are there any amendments to the main motion? Okay, hearing, hearing none, is there any further discussion? That being the case, then uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Ely? Against. Harris? Against. Hunter? For. Searles Law? Against. Amon? Against. Best? Abstain. Brown? Against. Wow. Okay, motion <laughs> fails. Four to, I'm sorry. Five to one, one sustained. All right. So the motion fails. All right, motion motion has, has failed. All right, um, with that, then I want to thank the public for every uh, all their comments tonight. We're going to move on to item five, which we have some media reports, so we're going to be here a while longer listening to some uh, reports. We have our back to school ready report, item 5.01 on the agenda right now. All right. You're going to come back, but you're still going to have to vote again. Does it make any sense? Well, Mr. Chairman, while they load up the, uh, the presentation, we are going to move forward with the back to school report. Uh, we have uh, one, of, this is this really is our kickoff to uh, to to putting. Um, some updated information in front of the, in front of the board and community. We obviously have a lot of communication events coming up um, later this uh, this month. Um, so I wanted to, in a similar fashion to last year, we unfortunately we are beginning the school year under um, somewhat similar circumstances. Although um, although some of the dynamics have changed, we have more vaccinations vaccinations available and other. Uh, and we are a year into this, so we uh, obviously know uh, how to. Uh, uh, implement safety mitigation strategies, contact tracing, many of the things we did not know um, a year ago or uh, we're starting. Uh, we are a one-to-one -one school division now, so all students have a device. Um, so we feel that this uh, will follow some similar protocol as last year when we t um, talked about our back-to-school report and how to maintain safety in our schools, uh, knowing that we will um, move, welcome our students back to five days of in-person instruction on September 8th. Some folks are still thinking it's the 7th. It is September 8th, which is a Wednesday. And we are looking forward to the arrival of students. So this um, presentation tonight will give a full understanding of our safety, um, safety challenges, how we plan to um, maintain safety, what our instructional program will look like moving into the new year, and some ancillary information such as athletics and other areas. So I will uh, turn it over to Mrs. Rousseau, who's joining us um, virtually, who will start off with uh, just an update on our most recent COVID metrics because we have to monitor those as we move into the new year 
to make sure that we respond accordingly. Mrs. Rousseau, are you, are you with us? Dr. Parker, I am with you, but uh, Mrs. Carlson is going to take us through these tonight. Awesome. Is Mrs. Carlson? Yes, I'm here. Okay. And we'll move to the first slide. Um, so I'm going to cover the updated CDC guidance, CDH guidance, and COVID metrics as they stand right now and opening school. This first slide shows the upward movement of COVID cases here in Newport News. This is as of uh, yesterday, 8.16 at 5 p.m. And as you can see, our cases um, are rising quite rapidly. The 502.7 per 100,000 is uh, based on the last 14 days. Normally, we had been basing our counts off the off seven days, which the next slide will show that. Um, as you can see, for Newport News, we are in the high transmission rate at 235.5 cases per 100,000 uh, people. I would like to add to this that uh, according to the UVA projection, we're going to peak the week of September 12th. And for the metro area, they're projecting that we'll have 30,912 cases of COVID by that time. And that the week of September 12th on the peninsula alone, we'll have 7,875 cases of, of COVID. Next slide, please. So in order to cut down on the transmission rate of COVID in our schools, as you know, um, Governor Northam has issued the uh, mask mandate for all public and private schools. And that's to keep everyone safe. Of course, regardless of your vaccination status, you're encouraged to wear a mask indoors, not only in schools, but out in the community. It's especially important for our athletes to wear their masks when they're not actually participating in their sport. And also due to the fact that none of our elementary age children uh, are eligible to be vaccinated at this time, they all should wear a mask while they're out on the playground because they will not obviously be maintaining social distancing while they're outside playing. Now, as our numbers go down, this can be readdressed. But right now, with our transmission rate being um, high, we do need to adhere to mask wearing. Next slide. Next slide. And these are the changes to the CDC guidance that are new for us this year. Again, mask wearing for everyone ages two and older, including teachers, staff, and visitors to all K-12 schools. Again, regardless of the vaccination status. Uh, one thing that the CDC has uh, and uh, encouraged is that anyone who is fully vaccinated who has had an exposure to a known or suspected COVID case should uh, be encouraged to get tested three to five days after that exposure, regardless of symptoms. We should be promoting vaccinations for everyone who is eligible. Uh, we should be um, monitoring the community transmission in our area, vaccination coverage, the screening, testing, and outbreaks, and those will be based on how we will layer our prevention strategies. In-person learning is most important, and for the physical distancing, we need to try and do three feet in between all students, but they do stress that if three feet cannot be maintained, that uh, we will continue with in-person learning and we will do physical distancing to the best of our ability. Next slide. So in order to prevent the transmission of COVID in our schools, again, we're gonna promote vaccinations with everyone, which we have sponsored vaccination clinics at Warwick High School, where we have vaccinated over 200 school age children, 12 and over. Uh, of course, we're in uh, consistent, correct mask use the physical distancing to the extent possible. Uh, one thing that we're discussing is doing screening for COVID to identify cases. It would be in those people who are um, not symptomatic. It would be what they call pooled testing, where with 
parental consent and with consent of staff members, weekly we would do pooled testing of individuals to identify those who may test positive and not be showing any signs of COVID at that time. Ventilation is important, hand washing and respiratory etiquette. Of course, staying home for all students, staff, teachers, and visitors when they're sick. We do need everyone to complete the, the self-questionnaire before they enter one of our buildings. All health services staff members will be conducting contact tracing to include isolation and quarantine, and of course, cleaning and disinfecting. Now for the contact tracing, one of the changes that the CDC has made for what they're considering a contact among students only is if the students are wearing masks and they're maintaining three foot social distancing, if the student is identified as a close contact, they will not need to quarantine, which will be wonderful news for our families because, you know, when we have to send that child home for 14 days, it's a hardship on the parents if they work outside of the home. Next slide, please. Um, again, this is talking about what the CDC has recommended, which is the universal masking, physical distancing, distancing to the uh, greatest extent possible, and additional strategies, which one thing that with our transmission rate being in the high um, transmission, the VDH had indicated that we should try and do distancing in our secondary schools at six foot. Again, that's guidance if it is at all possible, but as the next uh, statement says, we would not in exclude any students from in-person learning, that we would do the best we could with the distancing and, and our goal would be three foot between uh, students. Next slide. The physical distancing guidelines, uh, anyone who is not fully vaccinated should maintain six foot distancing from people who do not live in their household. Again, the three foot is between students in a classroom. Six foot is be between students and teachers and staff, and then between all teachers who are not fully vaccinated. While students are eating, we should try and maintain uh, six foot social distancing to the extent possible. Again, if that can't be done, we will do the best we, we can. Uh, cohorting is another way of trying to minimize the extent of, 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 of excuse me, of disease transmission. And with that, if, if we had an outbreak or one case, I should say, then the contact tracing would be easily done if the groups were together throughout the day. Next slide. And again, I mentioned this, we've been holding vaccination clinics since June. Oh, excuse me, we've done over 600 students ages 12 to 18. I'm sorry, I misquoted that. Our next clinic will be August the 24th at Warwick High School. We will continue clinics throughout the school year. Uh, we are encouraging families to vaccinate their children. The CDC has indicated that the Pfizer vaccine should be approved for our children younger than 12, hopefully in September. And also they have said that the Pfizer vaccine will have FDA approval within the next few weeks. Next slide. I think that's the, yeah, that's, I think that's the end of mine. Okay, so we'll move on to human resources. Um, we, uh, well, while we, while um, Nina, you've come forward, but while, what we'll do is take a moment to, if there, Mr. Chairman, if there are any specific questions to that particular area, we know we have a, a lot of ground to cover, so I would say to please uh, pace yourselves. Importantly. Quick right. question. So questions. Questions about about masks. I, I think in general. Just a quick question. Yes. How many um, vaccinations we did throughout the city? I might have missed that. Oh, um, six hundred. Over six hundred students ages twelve to eighteen. And, and what they have done is, 
you know, we, we are asking parents to sign up ahead of time. However, they are taking walk-ins and they had tried to arrange the clinics where the first clinic was you know, obviously for first time, uh, the first shot number one, and then the second clinic that was two weeks later was for the second vaccine. However, if we had students coming in at that second vaccine clinic to get their first vaccine, we were accepting them. And that's what they've continued to do. I was asking, so I was asking how many clinics have you had? Oh, how many clinics? We have had three. And where were they? We have, where were they? They were all at war? Yes, they've all been at Warwick High School. Yes. Do we plan to do some in the east end section of the city and the, as well as the Denby section of the city? Uh, in the beginning, that was the plan. But we are partnering with Riverside Hospital for uh, doing the vaccine clinic. And my understanding was they felt like we were over planning how many students that that Riverside was projecting that we would have come. And so we would have had too many clinics going on at the same time without enough student response. But I'm not sure, honestly, if they're planning on having a clinic north and uh, in our southeast community. I think that would be something good that we should maybe possibly look at with transportation being an issue with some parents they might can't get to work high school. I know it's not that far, but for some people it might be challenging for them to get there and may want their kids to be vaccinated. So if we could look in the future, maybe doing one in the East End section as well as in the Denby part of the city, I think that would be great just to make sure we're showing, um, giving everyone throughout the city a chance. Before before Mr. Wright responds, uh, Nancy, um, before we started offering our clinics, we also had approval at other vaccine, vaccine clinics for students ages 12 and older to become vaccinated. So I know we're representing 600 on this slide, but would you agree that with the uh, once the approval was made for 12, 12 and older to become vaccinated, uh, we did have families take advantage of available city um, citywide vaccination opportunities prior to our three clinics being offered? Am I correct? Yes, that's true. And as a matter of fact, when we cause we're currently doing contact tracing, and if it's uh, if I call a family that is involving a student, and the parent says to me hey, I really want to get my child vaccinated, we encourage them to seek out vaccination clinics out in the community. Of course, we tell them about the ones that we're having at Warwick, but you know, if the parent wants to go and try and get the vaccine now, we encourage them to go out and do that. Mr. Wright. School Board and Dr. Park, and to your um, question, uh, Mr. Ely, uh, we actually, our initial plans uh, did include uh, a transportation plan um, for our school division, uh, which represented uh, the, the South, uh, also Central um, and North. And I want to thank Shea Coates and John Payne, who worked really hard to make sure that we had a shuttle system going when we first started on June 19th. Uh, we only had three students uh, take advantage of the uh, transportation that day. We had parents and family members that were bringing you know, their uh, students and family members to Warwick High School. And also, I did want to mention that there will be another opportunity at the uh, um, community event on the 28th for vaccinations so and thank you Nancy how do we how do we get the information out to the parents if their record is just so low at three and I not and I know it might be just a stereotype I know it's been high especially in my community I'm not getting the vaccination but I just want to make sure that we are getting it out there to the parents that that they had the opportunity to get vaccinated but they just chose not to because with just three people taking advantage of it, it was like so did we send it out to the whole population in the East? Okay. Absolutely, we did. And we also send the live link that we received from Riverside in preparation for every student vaccination clinic. We send that out in advance um, through a blast um, you know, to our, our community, letting them know about the opportunity. We've gotten great responses. And we also don't turn anyone away. Um, so if families are showing up that day and uh, we're well over you know, 200, we continue to provide uh, vaccinations at the uh, at Riverside uh, as they continue to you know, pull those shots out. And we'll keep pushing. We plan to have clinics um, as we start the school year. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. 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 Ms. Amon, yes. Yeah, I had a mass question or questions um, because I've had some feedback from 
constituents, uh, if they have a medical or a religious situation where they're looking at one of the exceptions, you know, what do they do? Who do they contact? What is their process here? Um, and then also, as someone who I can wear a mask for a little bit, but at some point I start to hyperventilate, um, you know, that eight hours a day, five days a week is a long time for students. And um, are we encouraging our teachers and staff to work with the students and err on the side of kindness? I just have this vision of someone getting yelled at in the hall. And, um, you know, this, this is going to be an effort of, of everybody. And I just, I get concerned, especially the little ones or if someone needs a break. Um, but there's going to be, you know, a little bit of grace and kindness there. Um, and Nancy, I'll, I'll let you, uh, if I miss anything, I know we have fielded the same question regarding a religious exemption for mask wearing, and we're working with our uh, legal t legal staff to get uh, proper advancement on that. Um, there are um, there are considerations that have to be taken into place um, with a student who comes to school without a mask, and there are obviously, in addition to legal um, to that, to religious re religious requests, which we've received recently there are medical you know legitimate medical reasons why a student may such as severe asthma and other reasons why they may have some level of exemption with but we have to we're work what we're looking at right now one making sure we have adequate process um, to validate the request but then also the there are the safety implications in the school uh, we just went over some information where if one student's not vaccinated and another student's vaccinated and now you have you have mandatory quarantine uh, quarantining for 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 majority of students versus if both were wearing masks, you uh, you you may not have to send uh, so many students or staff home, depending on the circumstances. So we have to take those into consideration uh, whether we can socially distance the student, um, whether they are you know there may even be considerations whether they would submit to weekly testing. So we have to think about those things before we really come out with a proper response as we move together uh, move forward with our safety and mitigation uh, planning for the year. So. I know that uh, parent who brought the question forward is waiting for a response, but there's a reason why she hasn't received one is because we don't we necessarily have to work out the details uh, of that of that request and make sure that we can accommodate and or what those stipulations of accommodation would look like. Um, Nancy, did you have any other uh, uh, anything to add to that response? Uh, for the, the medical piece, if a child and a parent come in and they have a medical exemption mask exemption form from their physician they will present that to the nurse and the nurse will review it with them and that was in place last year also mm -hmm. yeah. other questions one thing um also when we were talking about the vaccinations also for anyone who is fully vaccinated whether that they receive two doses of the Moderna or the Pfizer or one dose of the Johnson and Johnson, then if they're identified as a close contact, they also will not have to quarantine for those 14 days. Okay, Mr. Chairman, we'll move on to the human resources uh, portion of the presentation. Thank Anise. you. Good evening, school board and Dr. Parker. As we look to start the school year, um, we have challenges with staffing, as also other districts are facing. Two critical areas for us are bus drivers and transportation and teachers. We currently have 73% of our total bus driver allocations filled and 92% of our teacher allocations filled. Many of our out of the area recruitment efforts, of course, have been halted due to COVID. So we have been targeting social media, radio advertisements, drive up job fairs and flyers. We've also been working with local universities to interview and make job offers to their December hires so that they can start in January. So we are working diligently and continuously to um, fill these vacancies. To help with the school opening for the teacher coverage, we are going to be using qualified substitute t teachers in those positions that are not filled by the time school starts. Uh, Mr. Coates, when he comes up with the transportation presentation, will discuss efforts he's making to open a uh, start school for transportation of the kids. All right, questions? Well, I'll just uh, ask a question as a sort of a PSA for our 
bus drivers, if you could just tell the public, what is it? What does it take? If someone is out there listening tonight and knows that we, you know, we need bus drivers, so what would it take for someone to be a bus driver for Newport News Public Schools? All right, I know that they do need a CDL, but we also have a class that if you don't have your CDL, you can come and we will train you to get your CDL to become a school bus driver. Is and it a clean driving record also? Yes, yes. Yeah. must be a clean driving record. <laughs> that, that eliminates a lot of folks. So that's, that's the big piece, but clean driving record, folks. Clean driving record. Okay, and wonderful. And then uh, our starting hourly pay for our bus drivers is, is what? Starting hour? So $15.84 an hour starting pay for a bus driver. And as I understand, we are offering a recruitment bonus at this time. Could you tell the public what is the recruitment bonus if you sign up to be a bus driver? $1,500. So $1,500. I'm going to sign more today. Than, yeah, there you go. <laughs> but can I quit tomorrow? Clean <laughs> driving record. So, so $1,500, which I believe is more than other divisions are offering on the peninsula. Uh, so that's a hefty bonus, signing bonus of $1,500, plus it's $15.84 an hour to be a bus driver. So please, um, folks out there in the public, you're looking for work, you have a clean driving record, come sign up because we need bus drivers. This really will impact our activities, our ability yes. to, um, uh, to uh, run all the schools as we need to run all of our programs that we have. Uh, this is, it, bus driving is essential to our division operations. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to sign up. I'm so sleepy. Good evening, board members, superintendent. Guest, uh, I'm here today to talk to you about what we've got going on at Plant Services. <clears throat> we've had a, we've been very busy this summer. Uh, we have a total of 102 projects going on, uh, from 11 flooring, as you can see, 15 uh, gym floor projects, uh, contracted projects, paving projects, HVAC projects, uh, casework replacements at two schools. Uh, solar projects in the mix, one completed, uh, there's five of those, and uh, the relocation project for South Morrison and also the Debbie Learning Center. So uh, to get into that, uh, to take a look at some of those projects, uh, HVAC replacements, as most of y'all know, they work around this building, telecommunications, and we also have one going on at Kiln Creek. We're finishing up on our second phase at uh, uh, Woodside High School and hopefully that will come to fruition here uh, by the end of the week. Uh, we've ran, we, you know, naturally we've had some problems with HVAC issues due to COVID, uh, getting things uh, delivered when they're supposed to get delivered. So it's been a challenge. Uh, the South Morrison relocation, most of this was done in the house with the exception of some uh, aesthetic work at Gatewood and down at Newsom Park. We pretty much took care of everything at uh, the new Katherine Johnson Adult Learning Center as we've kind of ear tagged it right now. Uh, so that's uh, hopefully they'll start moving in tomorrow at uh, Katherine Johnson Adult Learning Center and Gatewood should be ready by the end of the week. Knock on wood. Uh, casework replacements at Palmer and Achievable Dream. Uh, this is an ongoing effort. I think this is like school number nine or ten now to uh, receive casework. Auditorium catwalks, this is something nobody ever sees, but they're up there and our students utilize them. So uh, they were hazardous, so we had to close them down last year. Uh, Mitchfield and Warwick High School and Demi, we kind of put them off limits until we could replace them. So that's a, a good thing happening there. Canopy replacements at Yates, Saunders and Sanford. Uh, gym floor replacements at, I think it was six schools. Yep, and uh, what that's doing is uh, y'all have all been in gyms and seen the kind of cross-pressed uh, flooring system in there. It's called a grand wood. We're replacing it with a performance flooring. So uh, a lot less in uh, accidents, easier on the knees for kids. You know, slips, strips, and falls don't end so bad. Uh, electrical panel replacement at several schools, and we're replacing, overlaying. Uh, we actually milled out and overlaid uh, in the process of finishing up uh, Warwick High School, and we're in the process of finishing up Minchfield High School. So, you know, it would be unjust not to share some pictures, uh, as always. So, uh, these are some HVAC replacements. The one on your left is the ceiling at uh, telecommunications, and then as you can see, it's got a lot of new fancy duct work in it. In the uh, center, we're at Woodside, and over on the right, we are at Kiln Creek. 
Uh, this is always amazing to see new refinished floors. Uh, that's Warwick and Demby with their Demby's new logo and Warwick's new floor. Uh, I th they look great. Yeah, to see them in person is, does justice. So some flooring pictures. I know a lot of y'all have seen these before, but you know, there's a picture of what it looks like while you're working on it and why, then when it's done. Uh, this is South Morrison. We'll talk about that for a second. Uh, or not South Morrison, but uh, the Gatewood facility. We've kind of dropped the people on that and we just call it the Gatewood facility now. It's kind of what plant services here tag that. And so uh, I don't know how many of y'all had uh, visited the site when it was Gatewood, Pete. Uh, used to be pink, birds all over the, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> herons and everything else to, to kind of entertain the kids. And so now you can see it's gone back to uh, looking more like an administrative type site. Three of the classrooms there will be for high school GED and uh, an official testing, a GED testing center. And the rest of the sites will be uh, pretty much used for administrative purposes. And so, uh, and just so that everybody's kind of on the same page, the remaining part of the South Morrison program is mainly the adult uh, side of it is going down to uh, Newsom Park and the Demby Learning Center is going to the Catherine B. Johnson. So all that's worked out. Hopefully we'll start moving in this week and be prepared for school to start. So this is the old actual South Morrison building? No, no, no. I, this is this, I've, I've got it labeled as the South Morrison Relocation Project, but uh, this okay. is actually looking at offices and down the hallways of the, uh, the Gatewood facility, okay. which is uh, connected to the Wart Senior Center. Gotcha. So if there's any, is there any questions? I'll move on and I believe Mr. Jenkins is next. Yes. Uh, good evening, Chairman Brown, Vice <coughs> Chair Searles Law, member of the board, Dr. Parker. Um, I'm gonna be brief this evening. I don't have nearly as many slides or pictures as Mr. Beverly. Um, but we're pretty excited about our work in technology nonetheless. Um, our focus back to school um, this year as it was last year is on making sure that our staff and students have access to the technology and the internet connectivity that they need. Um, to that end, our high school teachers and many of our general administrators, uh, principals, assistant principals, guidance counselors, um, and other district folks will be receiving new laptops. That's part of our, um, our five-year computer refresh. We try to make sure that staff have computers that are no older than five years old. Uh, student devices, um, in continuing our one-to-one, -one, uh, we're working on transitioning some of our younger students to iPads instead of Chromebooks, um, and working with uh, the folks in teaching and learning and school leadership. Uh, we believe that our pre-K through uh, first grade students would be better suited with um, iPads. So uh, our pre-K students have iPads. Some of our kindergarten students already have iPads. We'll be working on the rest um, this coming year. We should have them within the first few weeks of school. And at that time, we'll swap out their Chromebooks. Those Chromebooks will get repurposed for other students in the district. And then next year, we'll work on getting the iPads for all of our first graders. Um, and to make sure that everybody's devices are working properly for the first day of school, we're hosting some, uh, we're calling them repair clinics. Um, they will be at our schools where students and families will be, host, be able to come to any of our schools. And if they have a Chromebook that maybe uh, needs some repairs or maybe it's not working at all, it needs to be replaced, they'll be able to come in. We'll be doing that, um, I believe it's 4 to 7 p.m. to give families an opportunity to come in after work and the locations, dates, and times will be posted on our district website. I believe they're in the back to school section and on the calendar. Yes, Ms. Amon. Um, I have a quick question as a parent of a teenager who I'm sure has not turned on his Chromebook since the last day of school in June. Um, are there any, will there be any updates when they turn it on? Were those automatically done? Any you know tips, suggestions, procedures for just getting it open and making sure it's all ready for this year? That, that's a great question. So we're going to be working with our, um, our partners in school leadership at the schools to get out some communication to families about to let them know about the clinics and also to let them know if they haven't turned on their devices to go ahead and turn it on, plug it in, make sure it charges. When, it, when they first turn it back on, if it's been off for a while, uh, the Chromebooks Google automatically pushes out updates. Um, so we'll, we'll get some tips out to folks. That's a great Great question. 
All right, and um, continuing on the theme, in addition to the devices, we're always concerned about making sure that all of our students have access to the internet. Um, we do, we're continuing all of the programs that we had last year, where uh, we have partnered with T-Mobile and Cox primarily as two vendors who are helping us make sure that our students are served. Um, the district currently has over 4,000 hotspots out, out to our families, and we'll continue to support that program. Uh, we're working with Cox through two different programs uh, to get broadband into folks' homes. We have about 700 families that we've uh, registered so far with, through the Cox program to get broadband in the home. Um, and then lastly, our call center, our virtual learning call center, which is the hub for all of this information, um, is also able to provide information to families about the emergency broadband benefit, which is separate from our program, where families can apply uh, through, I believe it's through the FCC, to receive up to $50 in reimbursement per month to pay to help pay for their broadband service at home. Um, so I encourage anybody who has any questions or concerns or needs help getting connected to the internet um, to call our virtual learning call center. The number's listed on the screen. They're also linked all over our website. Um, you can either fill out an app, you can fill out an application online, you can call and get your questions answered. So does anybody have any questions about the technology section? Great. I'm going to turn it over to. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long night. I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Alexander, our executive director of Child Nutrition Service. Good evening. Good evening. Mine is very short and sweet. One slide. <laughs> so I just want to talk about how we're going to feed um, students this year to help keep them safe. And in elementary meal service, we're gonna do breakfast, grab and go off the bus, which is what we did last year. Kids get off the bus, grab their meal, go to class. Lunch, we will be delivering a hot and cold option. You know, last year they took home a cold option to go home. So this year we'll be doing a um, hot and cold option and delivering it to the classroom. For middle schools, grab and go off the bus, the same eating in the classroom, but they will come down for um, lunch, they will come through the line, but then go back to the classroom. Mm -hmm. And in high school meal service, they will come through the line for both breakfast and lunch, but then ultimately eat in the classroom. And a lot of that it has to do with packaging and the amount of food that we have to serve and the meal pattern that we have to use and that kind of thing. Um, and then we will have for our virtual students, we will be feeding from 1 to 1.30 in all elementary schools, virtual students can come by and get a meal, a breakfast and a lunch. So we are very excited about getting back to normal and <laughs> feeding our kids in the school. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I'm happy to introduce Shea Coates. <laughs> <laughs> We've hungry now. Good evening, Chairman Brown, Vice Chair Searles Law, Board Members, Dr. Parker. As with previous school years, Here Comes the Bus app and web version will be free for all Newport News public school families. Here Comes the Bus allows parents to get real-time location of their assigned bus and the capability for them to set alerts with regards to how close the bus is to the stop. The Here Comes the Bus app is available on iOS and Android devices. Bus stop information will be available on Tuesday, August the 31st. Information can be obtained from multiple sources such as the NPS website, parent view, student view, and at school open houses. If your student needs bus transportation to and or from a child care location within your zone, we ask that you please complete the transportation child request no later than August the 20th to ensure you have the right transportation on the first day of school. This can be done online or at your school. We ask the transportation eligible families do not, that do not require transportation to please opt out of trans transportation by providing the student's name and school uh, name and school to the email noted on the screen. This information was also sent out by our community relations on August the 14th. This will help a great deal in our current environment. We also encourage carpooling for those that drive their students to school. This action can cut down on the traffic congestion that we will see at our schools. With regards to safety, the one thing I want to note is our highlight is our yellow, yellow three card system. These cards are required for our pre-K and our kindergarten students to exit the bus. 
The person that is getting this student off the bus must have a corresponding yellow card. During the first week of school, we will allow you to get your student off the bus with a government issued photo ID until everybody gets their yellow card because some people want to go to open house, so we give them a little grace period. But starting the second week of school, we will require that you have your corresponding yellow card. And some things that are upcoming for transportation, we have 31 uh, propane fuel full AC buses come in uh, late September, early October. That'll move our fleet to 125 out of 340 buses as we continue to move our fleet to a propane uh, fleet. Uh, also, we got seven new activity buses that will come in late September. Those activity buses will be used for our secondary schools so they can help out with small field trips or coaches that want to transport their own students and we'll provide the training for them. Uh, also on a sad note, kind of the last part is uh, the NNPST pass. Um, what this team pass does is when a school student gets on the bus, they scan on and off the bus. We have here comes the bus, we know where the bus is, but sometimes the parent, the parent doesn't know if their child is on, their student is on the bus. So this allows them to know whether that child is on the bus or it works with. Here comes the bus app, uh, <clears throat> just to make sure we get the right student on the right bus. It also helps us with, in our current environment, with uh, contact tracing. Um, you can see the side, the T pass is the size of our ID card, our cards that we have now. So when we do roll this out, uh, we were supposed to roll out in September, but the manufacturer, we got caught by the manufacturer uh, um, shortage in parts for the RFID readers for the bus, so they won't be in until November, so we delayed the rollout of this to January. We have a, co a company that will be making all the cards, initial cards for all our students up front, and then we have uh, printers available right now just uh, that will go to our secondary school, so they don't have the ability to uh, to print cards for kids who lose cards, and we'll work through those procedures before we start in uh, January. Also, as Ms. Nina talked about uh, shortages, some of the things that we've had to do uh, with our large shortage of uh, drivers is, is when they talk about the school schedule, how we have to space out our tiers to give us more time in between for our cleaning protocols, and also allow our drivers, some drivers only do two schools in the morning. We, space it out so we might have some drivers do three or four schools, uh, three or four different schools in the morning to be able to do that. Uh, so we space out the tiers, gives them enough time in between an hour in between of taking them. So that's some of the things we're doing. Some of our support that we usually provide for after school, and I've talked with the secondary leadership of providing, we sometimes provide three different times we come in with four different buses to take kids uptown, downtown, midtown, although we, we just can't do that this year. So we're working on scaling that back um, and, and work with them to see what we can do. But we will make sure all our sports teams are supported as far as games of that nature. Ronnie? All right, question. Yes, Ms. Heyman. Um, I have a quick question on the opt-out. Um, if a family said, well, I can take my kids to school in the morning, but I can't you know, bring them home, would that be an appropriate email to reach out and say they don't need morning transportation? Yes, they, they can do that, yes. Okay. Yeah. You know, as he said that fast, he was, he was happy to take that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Need all the help we can get this year, so. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. I, so I just have a, a comment, which yes. is, um, so the T-Pass, it yes. allows the uh, parent to know, I swipe the T-Pass, the parent actually can see on the Here Comes the Bus app, I got on the bus, then they can, you know, if they want to, they can follow that bus ride and see, hey, when the kid got off the bus. Off the bus, yes. That is, and so I just want to comment that that is mm -hmm. phenomenal. Um, that's just really wonderful, and I hope that the public how can we? How can the board help get word out to the public about this, um, this wonderful uh, <coughs> invention, this this wonderful thing that we're doing? Yeah, I think once we, you know, we were ready at one point, then we got the whole back. So I think in the fall we'll be developing procedures and starting to push that out to everybody to have it. Because all kids will have a T pass, even though you're not transportation eligible. Every school, every student would have one because we also figured out that RFID, the code in there, you can also use at the library. Mm -hmm. So we work with the library that we might be able to use wow. that. To, to check out books and how does that adapt to the library also in Newport News Public, I mean, in, in the city libraries also. So just that technology starts in transportation, mm -hmm. but how can we roll it out through the whole division yeah. other places as we go along? Quick question. Yes, yes Mr. Healy. I know this don't happen in Newport News, but say for instance, um, a child get on a bus and a child fall asleep, 
And so this T pass will let the bus driver know that there's still one child left on the they bus. Use, once we figured out how the, the they should be able, they can go back and see if the child got off the bus real quick. And we can and actually if we had the incident, we can mm -hmm. respond very quick to know to look in the system and say, Okay, this child never got off that bus. So it show like twenty nine checked in, twenty eight checked 28, out. Yeah. Yeah. So it's one still up here. Yes. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. Amazing. <clears throat> uh, curious uh, how the students are going to keep up with the cards, though. Uh, well, <laughs> so with the initial package that we give out to the schools, they'll have um, our youngest students will have breakaway lanyards. Breakaway. So they're not, mm -hmm. you know, somebody just wants to pull on it. And then they have cards where you can secure them in, which are pretty tight. They really, once you get them in, it's almost impossible trying to, for me as an adult, trying to get them out. So they have those, and we we'll work through those procedures. Of, okay, how do we place one? If we have a kid that keeps on losing, what do we do? So those things like that. As we we get closer to that. So yeah, just curious uh, curiosity on the cost of the card. You know, per card cost. A dollar fifty five. A dollar, so a dollar fifty five. Dollar fifty five per card to get me. So it's some places it's three or four bucks. So this is this is pretty good. So they're making over twenty. Based on our population, we'll get twenty thirty three thousand cards all made. But that's definitely worth extra. it. Yeah, that's worth it. Any more questions? I had a question. Yes. So did you say something about a printer will be in the high schools? Yes. Right now, Dr. Best, each, the high school, the secondary, right now, as far as resources, we can afford to get them mm -hmm. in, in the high schools. And for elementary school, until we get, we're able to afford to, to put them in all the elementary schools, transportation will be taken care of those schools, when they have a request, there'll be a process where they go into our issue track system, request the card be made, and then our supervisors for those schools, they will make sure those cards are delivered to elementary schools. But the high, secondary schools will have the ability uh, on hand to do cards themselves. So is there a quick turnaround time? Um, you, you anticipate if the child doesn't have it, to have it that after, if they don't have it that morning, have it that afternoon, and if not, if you just ran the Xerox copy with that barcode, would that work? It's a the it's a RFID chip inside of it. It's a chip. It's okay. a chip inside of it within the card. Okay. So it's not that the barcode because okay. all they're doing is walking by and it's scanning. We it's we didn't okay. go with the barcode system. Okay. So we I think once we get a little meat on the bones and figure out the process is how long we we expect it to take because the system has to update and then work with those kids who need to get on the bus and make sure they have some. The pass to get onto the bus. I got one last question. What if the child comes to the bus in the morning without that car? Do we allow them on the yes, bus? Yeah, we're not, we're not going to turn away a kid to get on okay. the student to get on the bus. So we can get them on. And the driver can manually go in there and push, push it if he has to. You know, you get some bus stops with 40 kids. You know, that's why we want the car. It's easier just right. to swipe for them to go in and, and he, can, he or she can go back and manually add that student in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Combs. Okay. I'll be followed by Dr. Tim Maglema, our Chief Academic Officer. Sheesh. Mr. Meat. That was the appetizer. Yeah. That was the appetizer. Mr. Meat. Man, I've got to go back. I'm just pricing me. Good evening, Dr. Parker. Welcome, Ms. Patterson. As you know, last spring, um, we were very hopeful about where we were going with our COVID metrics. But we were still um, forward thinking in the fact that we wanted to provide virtual options for both um, our students and for our families. Um, so last spring, and actually all last year, we worked on the Virtual Learning Academy, um, which is in place for this fall, which is student virtual choice. Um, there was a student application process taken up on May 26, 2021, and currently we have 160 enrollments. We had um, lots more applications, but for lots of various reasons, um, students decided it wasn't a good fit for them because of class selections and sports and other various things. Currently, we have four teacher vacancies. That's a shameless plug. So if you teach U.S. history, geometry, art, and world geography, please reach out to us. And um, we're really hoping to expand over the next three years to K through 12. Um, and then we also wanted our family choice for a, a pandemic learning option. You know that we utilize Virtual Virginia, which is our statewide learning um, management um, or statewide virtual learning program. 
um, and it was only three semester one, and parents had the option to select into that by a certain date. Um, this is obviously a very student-driven type of learning, which means it's mainly asynchronous, and there would be some synchronous options for our students. The registration deadline was July 15, 2021, and um, that was set by Virtual Virginia so they could plan for fall. As you know, it's a statewide system. But as you know, we, um, we have variant, the Delta variant, and we're looking towards fall and how we can provide more family options. But we're currently facing some present challenges. Um, the focus right now, because of the governor's mandate and Senate Bill 1303, is that we are mandated to provide in-person instruction for all of our students. And as you heard from Ms. Nina Farish, that we have a teacher vacancy for in-person instruction. So this causes a little bit of a pickle for us. Um, virtual Virginia cannot accept <coughs> any more registrations as it's at its class size capacity. Um, and there's also another challenge that we face in Newport News, which is that we've learned from our data this past year that our students um, really struggled to learn online. Not all of them, but the majority of our students are really struggling with online learning. <coughs> so we have to take that into consideration as we move into fall of 2021. So the solutions for families that are seeking virtual learning right now because of the Delta variant, um, we are working with a third party solution as we already have a teacher shortage. We can't rely on our teachers to provide this virtual instruction. Unfortunately, again, it will be another a fully, almost fully asynchronous option for our students, meaning it's student driven and teachers will only be there occasionally to support our students. The current virtual provider is requiring that if they sign up as a parent and your students in their classes that you have to have a literacy or a learning coach through K-5 and the learning coach would be the family member. Um, so if this is still of interest to you and you're worried about the Delta variant, then we want you to contact your school to be placed on a wait list as we're still working out all the details with our third party provider. Some considerations that I want our families to think about though before they sign up for full time virtual learning for their students for the fall semester. Of course, our priority is always on student safety. We think of that first, and we are making sure that we follow all CDC guidance um, very, very carefully. We take it very, very ser seriously. And we also have to realize that there is a reality of learning loss um, that we're seeing in our data, but there's also a social emotional wellness. If we speak to our local pediatricians, they will tell you that the cases of anxiety and depression have skyrocketed since COVID. Um, so, and we have to be cognizant of the fact that the learning for this fall will be mainly asynchronous with some teacher synchronous supports. The family will become the learning coach and learning will occur during the day, Monday through Friday. All division diagnostic tests and state mandated tests will still have to be scheduled and will still have to be taken within a school building. So that is my update on virtual learning for this fall. If you have any questions, I can take them now. Questions? I'll, I'll just ask a, uh, try to ask a summarizing <clears throat> question, which it sounds like what you're saying is that right now students are set for in-person instruction. If a family, due to whatever their safety concerns are, change, uh, decide they want to change their mind, they can sign up for the virtual academy, but Not there, is, there isn't a, there isn't necessarily space available right now. They go into a waiting list. Mm -hmm. um, how last year, these decisions became final at a certain point. You know, as far as the first semester, second semester is if, once you go onto the waiting list for the virtual academy, is that a final decision for the semester? What is yeah? What is the logistics of that? Okay, so the virtual learning academy is open currently right now, nine through twelve. And if we have the teaching space, we will definitely take any nine through twelve grader right now. It is a full year option. Virtual Virginia is full. So this particular third party option would be for the first semester unless the, the, the family chooses to go for the full year. Okay, so first grade through eighth grade, really it's, it's in person is, is what we have. Mm -hmm. And for that, um, set virtual Virginia is full as, as well as far as we know. Mm -hmm. So really this is, what, this is what we have for families is, is in person this year. Mm -hmm. All right, and, for, and for those students who are um, in virtual the virtual learning academy, 
or the virtual Virginia program, we are mandated by, by, the, by the state and VDOE if a student or family chooses to go back to in-person instruction, uh, we will accommodate that request. But we obviously wanted our families, that uh, students who, who uh, enrolled in the Virtual Learning Academy to commit to a time, to a time frame of making that program work. Uh, but, we, uh, some, but for some students, that model is, may not be the best model for their learning, and we want to make sure we put students in a position where they can be their most successful. Thank you very much. Right now I'd like to introduce um, Mrs. Um, Lori Wall, who will give you some updates on elementary instruction for Paul. Thank you, Dr. Mangala. If we were in an elementary classroom, I would give you a wiggle break, a movement break, um, <coughs> so feel is. free if you need to okay. stretch a little bit. Um, I'm used to being in an elementary classroom. So thank you. I'm going to share just um, a little bit about our Spark, uh, our summer step Spark that just ended, and give you uh, a little bit of information. This summer, we served 1,114 students. They participated in a five-week summer school Spark program, where they engaged in small group literacy, scientific investigation, and engineering, and number talks to work um, on computational fluency. We have uh, data that will come this fall around the growth gain this summer, and we'll share that at a later board meeting. Um, they rounded out their summer experience with a camp week in partnership with the Flying Classroom, and the Flying Classroom is a STEM-based curriculum um, based on the global expeditions of Captain Barrington early. And in addition to the in-person students who attended summer school, we had 196 students virtually participate in the flying classroom camp. So we just wanted to start with um, the, the learning continued through the summer um, for our students, as well as um, a summer portal for any students to learn anywhere, anytime. So I'm gonna share a couple of exciting, hopefully still at 10 o'clock exciting, elementary curriculum revisions. While students were enjoying the summer spark experience, the curriculum team spent this summer making revisions to support the return to full day in-person instruction. First and foremost, in addition to implementing the SEL curriculum, Caring School Communities, we've built in new supports for relationship and community building across all content areas. So for example, in math, students will spend time exploring ideas and concepts such as perseverance, the value of making mistakes, and growth mindset. And in literacy, additional time has been allocated in the first units to learn to develop student agency through collaborative structures and establishing procedures and routines. As well, we've um, made curriculum revisions uh, in our pacing guides and unit plans, and they've been revised with a focus on priority standards. These standards ensure deeper learning of essential content. And another way we address essential content in math specifically is through the addition of a 30 minute acceleration block during which students will engage in adaptive online learning through Dreambox, as well as personalized instruction based on identified needs um, as diagnosed, based on diagnostic and pre-assessment data. In reading, Instructional routines have been created to support the development of foundational literacy skills needed to become a proficient reader. And in science and social studies, the emphasis of the priority standards is evidenced through the additional hands-on learning experiences to include the analysis of primary and secondary sources, as well as engaging in scientific investigation and engineering practices using new science tools that teachers will be getting this fall. In recognition of being a one-to-one -one division, we will continue to utilize Canvas as our learning management system in grades K through five in order to support blended learning. Canvas should include a balance of instructional resources and online activities. It will also serve as the primary communication tool with partnering with families as we use this year. And in preschool, we opted to use Seesaw this year as the learning management system, but it will say, um, serve the same purposes for our youngest <coughs> learners. 
Before I share a couple of examples of what blended learning might look like in elementary, as a refresher, I would like to revisit the blended learning visual that Dr. Mingelmont shared at the May board meeting. As you can see, blended learning, it's a combination of face-to-face -face and virtual learning experiences. So I'm gonna give you an example um, of on the, le on the left hand side, um, this might be seen during the literacy block. This is an example of a rotation model. One group of students could possibly be receiving differentiated small group instruction from the teacher, while another group could potentially be working online in Canvas or using an adaptive learning platform designed to address student specific learning needs. And finally, a third group of students could be working offline with a choice of whatever they would want to be reading or writing. The example on the right could be um, used, for example, in social studies. In this example, the entire class could be studying the same content or concept. However, each rotation would approach the concept a little differently. One group of students could be working offline, analyzing a primary source, while another group could be online, reading a piece of text or watching a video clip on the Discover Education site while still another group could be extending and applying their learning through the construction of a product to demonstrate their understanding of the concept. This model allows for the teachers to engage with all three groups throughout this block of time. It also allows for the student choice with pace and path of learning. So that should give you a little bit of um, some examples around what blended learning would look like in, uh, as it relates to what remote or hybrid learning look like last year. So before I turn it over to Dr. Jones to talk about secondary curriculum and development, does anyone have any questions? Yes, Ms. Heyman. Um, I have two questions. Yes. One regarding the blended learning, this doesn't, does this eliminate like the classic, like where you might have a teacher standing up in front of the classroom teaching everybody we're going to do the initial class on addition, and then they might go into some of this, or does this, is this complemented? It is complemented. So if we were to consider the math block, that 30 minutes is in addition to the 60 minutes of the math block where a teacher would be working and with the whole class, differentiated instruction. Kids could be working in pairs or group, while the teacher could be modeling and doing explicit teaching. Okay. Um, and my second question was back just when you were talking about the social emotional learning, the new curriculum. Uh, if we or parents or community members wanted to learn more about that curriculum that we've added, where would they go to look? Sure. So we can get information that will be um, shared at Open House about our social emotional curriculum, um, as well as a little bit of the information around morning meeting. Um, and the social emotional aspects of what I talked about within the curriculum. So teachers can share that at open house um, with, with their parents. Thanks. Anyone else? Questions? Any other questions? Right, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Jones who will talk about secondary education. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening. I'm going to begin by basically highlighting a couple of the summer opportunities that our students had this year. Um, this is not comprehensive of all the summer programs, but these definitely informed um, the planning for unfinished learning for the fall. During our middle school spark, we only had 286 students to attend. However, those students were very consistent with their attendance. We had English and math instruction. The English instruction focused on a comprehensive Read 180 program that provided whole group, small group, and computer-based adaptive instruction for each student. In math, students focused on foundational skills while also incorporating goal setting and tracking their performance. Student learning was extended in, extended in the core classes, but also during enrichment, where they had the opportunity to participate in five strands. The first strand was STEM, which focused also on computer science, robotics, and cybersecurity. The second strand was scientific investigation. The third strand was history and debate. The fourth was health and physical education, where students had the opportunity to participate in outdoor education activities. 
and the fifth was visual, visual and performing arts. I was really excited um, to see the student share her experience about Summer Institute for the Arts earlier. So the students that attended middle school also participated in visual and performing arts activities this, summers, this summer. Students rounded off the summer program by participating in local field trips. This year, we decided to offer a summer virtual extended learning opportunity that provided asynchronous skill extension with the opportunities for students to participate in Newzella, No Red Ink. They had an opportunity to read, to read and reflect, and in math, they focused on IXL. We had 155 students participate in this asynchronous program in English and 137 participate in math. We offered two new camps this summer, something new that we had not done before, which was our dual immersion camp. It was held at Gittersleeve Middle School for one week for students in grades six and seven. You know, our seventh graders were there last year, but many of them um, were not in school together. So we combined our rising sixth graders and seventh graders together. Um, and we had a total of 45 students. The students um, engaged in immersive language experiences. They also um, created a community um, together because we actually mixed the sixth and seventh graders together so they could kind of mentor one another. And they also participated in engaging, engaging cultural experiences. Also, we had the EAGER camp at William & Mary. EAGER stands for Elevate engineering, advance innovation, guide learning, affect change, remove barriers to ensure equity for all. So this was also a new camp this summer that students really um, had a great um, opportunity to participate in in grades six through eight. I want to thank our curriculum um, team, instructional supervisors, specialist coaches, and teachers for taken so much time to revise the curriculum this summer. Um, as Lori mentioned, they also focused on the priority standards, of course, the standards to endure deeper and essential learning. They also incorporated critical thinking and problem solving, inquiry and investigation, more formative versus summative assessments, as well as performance assessments, and curriculum compacting and differentiating for our gifted learners. Second aspect that our teams focused on was student agency, incorporating social and emotional learning, learning, and of course the profile of a learner. So in all their curriculums um, and their curriculum maps, they made a conscious effort to integrate social and emotional learning as well as attributes of a profile of a learner. And then finally, we focused on inclusion of diverse content, just being very culturally um, inclusive of people and perspectives, um, real world applications and connections across contents. We really have a very heavy, heavy, um, very heavy um, emphasis on secondary unfinished learning. We wanted to ensure that we were addressing all tiers of instruction, particularly for our grades six through eight and also a tier one instruction for high school. So we've incorporated programs and really made some strategic decisions so that we could support students at all levels. Um, one of the new programs that we will be implementing this year will be Newzella, which is um, used across contents and grades and it's also based on students' Lexile level. So although it's a tier one resource, it is very adaptive to meet students wherever their needs are. So while we haven't quite um, incorporated tier three resources for high school, this is an area that we will be working towards this year. Canvas integration, of course, it will continue to be our learning management system to support blended learning. Laura gave you a really good overview of blended learning, so I won't repeat that. Canvas also includes a balance of instruction and resources. It provides equitable access for our students. It is engaging. It allows them to interact individually as well as with others. And it also helps um, them create and to demonstrate learning and mastery. In Canvas, teachers will develop lessons based on the 5E model. 
engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate. And that seemed to work really well for the teachers using that model this year. Do you have any questions? I have. Okay. Yes, Dr. Best. Yes. For the um, curriculum revisions, are they in teachers' hands now, like in how? Not yet. They're making final revisions, mm -hmm. but when teachers come back, they will definitely be available. Okay. They are offering new teacher sessions this summer, but they are going to um, roll it out in stages. You know, the new teachers will get some of it, but when all the teachers return, they will give them the full curriculum. Okay. Thank yep. you. But they're working on it. They're finishing, finishing it up. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Stanette Bird, School Leadership, and Felicia Barnett. Thank you and greetings from the Department of School Leadership. Uh, Dr. Barnett and I are here to round off this portion of the presentation today. Uh, you've heard a lot of good information and we certainly can address any questions you may have about the implementation of any of the items that you heard today. But before then, we do have a couple of announcements that we'd like to share with you as well as our families who are viewing from home. Uh, student schedules will be available in parent view um, no later than Wednesday, September 1st. Um, so at that time, um, parents and students can log on to their computers, go to their student and parent view and be able to see their course schedules. Um, also during the orientations that we have scheduled in um, middle and high school, students will have paper copies available as well. And of course the first day of school we will have paper copies available for students as well. But <coughs> starting Wednesday, September 1st, they can view online. A couple of important dates, we have uh, open houses coming up and we have made the decision to um, go virtual with our open houses. And so you'll see here on the screen that for elementary, including pre-K open house will be held on September 2nd. And we will follow similar processes that we did last year where we will allow our schools and administrators and teachers to do uh, the creative and brilliant things that they did last year. I think we, we've seen some Facebook Live, some Zoom meetings. We've seen some um, videos, pre-recorded videos where teachers uh, were able to speak to their students directly. So we want to continue doing those creative things. Uh, we also recognize that our younger students, specifically pre-K and kindergarten, they need that face-to-face -face opportunity. So we are going to offer an in-person experience for our pre-K and kindergarten students where they can come and meet their teachers um, along with their parents. And so that's what um, we have lined for elementary. Good evening. We're also excited to share that we have some similar opportunities available for our middle and high school students. We'll have our middle school open house on September 1st. It'll also be a virtual experience. Um, but we're also excited that we'll have in-person opportunities for our rising sixth graders and our seventh graders to enter their middle school because just like sixth graders, this will be their, our seventh graders' first time in their building for most of them. So they'll have an opportunity to ride their bus, come into their school building, get their class schedules, um, meet their teachers, and get a tour of the building. Um, we'll be able to do the same thing for our seventh graders and for our high school students on September 3rd, uh, we'll have an orientation in person for our high school students to visit their schools. Um, in the morning, we'll host our ninth graders, and in the afternoon, we'll host our 10th graders, and transportation will be provided for both groups. We're also looking ahead towards the end of September where we'll offer our back to school nights for both middle and high school students. <clears throat> this gives our families a more intimate opportunity to really find out about the curriculum, about the schedule for the year, some of the exciting things will be happening in the school as well as in uh, the classrooms and also give our students opportunities to sign up for clubs and activities. We also want to share some uh, changes uh, to our school schedule, our time of day, our operating day. Uh, we have made some adjustments that place our tier A schools 
arriving about 10 minutes earlier than they have typically arrived. And then this uh, slight change is also impacting some of our C schools where they may remain about 10 or 15 minutes later. This information has already been sent out to our families and it's also posted on our websites for families to see. Finally, there are lots of information on our school division's website, um, and you can access information about registration, supply lists, open houses, and our orientations, our school calendars and schedules, bus stop information, and breakfast and lunch menus. So families have a wealth of resources that they can access on our division website, and our school web pages also uh, will provide many of those um, information as well. And finally, I'd like to share a report to you around our athletics. Fall sports have already begun uh, with many of our uh, teams conditioning and preparing for the year in July with golf and football. And then in August, the early August, we started as well with competition cheer, uh, sideline cheer, cross country, field hockey, and volleyball. Um, this year, our JV and middle school sports will compete this year, and this is something that we were not able to do last year, especially for our middle schoolers, so we're excited that they'll be able to compete this year, and a full schedule of games will be played for our varsity, our JV teams, and for our middle school teams. Along the lines of last year, as we continue this year with um, utilizing our mitigation strategies, we will continue with those um, that are already in place. And so our student athletes must take a health screening questionnaire before practice and or game. Uh, personal protective equipment will be provided for our students that include masks and gloves, face shields, uh, touchless hand sanitizer dispensers and equipment cleaner. Uh, practice and safety plans are submitted to the school administration by our coaches. Um, our, during our coaches' meetings, they continue to cover topics such as face covering, social distancing, and practice plans. Um, there are parent meetings that are held that discuss mitigation strategies and team rules. And then there are additional documents such as a student questionnaire and assumption of risk and waiver that must be signed. So finally, what we've all been preparing and waiting for, our first day of school is Wednesday, September 8th, and we're excited to welcome our students and families to a great school year. Thank you, this concludes our report. Are there any questions? Yes, Ms. Amy? Um, the open houses um, at middle and I think elementary, are those gonna be, they're virtual, are they gonna be in the evening? So if parents are home after work? Yes, they will be in the evenings. We've uh, slated some times between uh, five and seven in the evenings and uh, schools will post their specific links and uh, specific times during that time slot for families. Um, and you know, we've talked about a lot of specifics, this just hasn't come up. Are we anticipating lockers to be used like in middle and high school or is that gonna be different than past years? We haven't quite made our final decision around the use of lockers. We'll continue to make sure we're utilizing a process that's safe for all students. And so that information, once it's decided, will be shared with our uh, students and families. We have any? All right, wonderful, thank you. I believe is that, that concludes our back to school report. That is the back to school report, Mr. Chairman, and we will uh, we are anxiously waiting to get more. Um, while we, our website is up and running, parents can uh, use that as a resource. We're also uh, going to send out communication to families real soon to make sure we have a Facebook Live session. Uh, just getting good information out, and uh, if, if anyone is uh, contacted, we would di recommend directing them to the website where we'll continue to update information as it becomes available. So. Uh, Dr. Parker, item 5.02, renaming the school's update, is in board members' packets. Uh, within board docs, there is a written report. Uh, barring any uh, objection from the board, and we uh, proceed to item 5.03, and board members can read the uh, renaming the school's update in their board packets. It is, if it's the will of the board, we'll move on to the next to 5.03, which is a textbook adoption, but Mr. Chairman, uh, All right. if that's uh, the will of the board. All right, so uh, we'll we'll move on to item 5.03. And thank you, Mr. Wright. Thank you. So 5.3 is a uh, science uh, 20, 2021 science uh, textbook adoption. Uh, Don. 
and we will have Dr. Jones come up and uh, and kick it off. Thank you, Dr. Good Jones. Good evening, Chairman Brown, Vice Chair Searles Law, members of the board, and Dr. Parker. Tonight, Dr. Rodney Culverhouse will present with you, to you the science adoption process, timeline, stakeholder participation, and feedback regarding the approval for the science textbooks for the 2021-22 school year. I present to you Mr. Colfax. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Good evening, Chairman Brown, Vice Chair Soros Law, distinguished board members, Dr. Parker. I would like to discuss with you tonight the uh, recommendation for the 2021 secondary science textbook adoption. So this process started when the VDOA actions were that they adopted new SOL standards, and that was in 2018, but because of the COVID pandemic, things were pushed back an additional year, and so we had to back up and slow down. And then it wasn't until October of 2020 that the state actually published their state approved list. So the purpose in us taking this action now is to maintain a resource that supports the learning needs of all NMPS students and provides teachers with a tool that will provide a useful and current resource that aligns with the district expectations of the profile of a learner. The last textbook adoption for Newport News Public School Science was 2010. And these resources have run their course and need to be aligned to better support a blended learning environment. And I believe there's a few uh, electives that were last adopted in 07. So, you know, that, that has definitely run its course. The current resource does not provide any of these supports since the contract for these ran out last school year. And the, uh, there was a gap in last school year, and I will talk to you in a couple of slides about how we compensated for that gap and found a resource that's much more credible and advantageous to our students' success. So with the one-to-one -one initiative that we have now, new resources and new doors have been opened. And there's, last year there was no current digital access for the textbooks we had in place, but we did have digital <coughs> access that I will speak of. So our timeline. So as I stated, last October after the VDOE published the state approved textbook list, this information was released, textbook vendors were contacted, and samples were sent to all schools so that all teachers could evaluate the resources. Teachers were also given digital access because there were many of the staff members that were teaching from home because of the COVID waivers. So they did have a digital access to the products that we were evaluating for this adoption. So leads compiled the results and placed them in a master document for the school and then the results were sent to me. Teachers had approximately three months to evaluate the material. So it wasn't like, you know, typically you get a month or two, everybody's in the building, you have some meetings, but because of COVID and the lack of access, you know, at any given time, they were given a three month window, basically from January to March 30th, to evaluate the leads met with their teams, the teams made their recommendations, and the data was gathered to determine which books were most appealing to the teachers that they thought would be most successful to the students. At this point in time, the books that were chosen were placed out in the admin lobby, which you probably have saw from May and June. And once again, because of COVID, there were some restrictions in place, but you know we, we handled it the best we could to try to get as much public viewing as possible. <clears throat> And the important thing here is that last adoption was 11 years ago. Now with expectations of profile of a learner, we really need to move forward with new resources and better resources to best, best equip our students. The list of textbooks being adopted are presented here. And of these books, a minimum of 70% of the teachers chose the book that is on this list. And of those that didn't choose the book that's on this list, the typical response would it was it was their second choice. So we didn't go from 70% uh, choosing this book and then 30% choosing something completely different. It was a it was a one-two race between the two, up to probably about 95% of, of the choices. And uh, if you notice, it's a it's a well 
uh, evolved list of books, but one thing that may stand out to you is that the only EOC book, which is your SO of courses, it's essential chemistry. Of the other books, I'll talk about the resource that we'll use there. And then for physics, we already have a current physics books, book in place. For the last three years, the, te the physics teachers were involved in a grant through the Office of Naval Research, and they were given free books, and they were given free technology to assist them with the books that opens the door for digital access, for digital probeware, and just a really involved process for those physics teachers. So the resource that is, has really been a game changer for us, last year I told you that we didn't really have any digital access for resources. So we did a lot of research and CK-12 kept popping up, CK-12. Talked to other districts, they're like, yeah, this is, and it's actually a foundation. CK-12 has been around for over a decade. It's not something that, oh, now we have a pandemic, we're gonna create something overnight. This is a product that's been in existence for multiple years. And what they were able to do was provide us not only with a digital resource, they provide a textbook, they provide simulations in that textbook, they provide small videos, they provide adaptive learning for students. So if I have a student who is trying to master a content, they have to get 10 questions right with this adaptive learning. As they get questions right, it increases the difficulty. If a student gets two of the more difficult questions wrong, it drops them back down <coughs> to the easier. So once the student has done this, a teacher can look at a student's re report and it may say, okay, they got 10 questions correct, but they were all at the low level. So now as a teacher, I'm automatic, hey, now's the time for intervention for the student. We can build them to get those middle grade and get to the high level. So it's a, it's a great resource, and the beauty of this resource is that typically with textbooks, you know, you may get a Virginia edition. The Virginia edition is not any different than the California edition. All the textbook vendors have done is taken our standards and tried to figure out where they align with the product that they've already created. With CK-12, we can take their pre-printed book, we can add resources to it. We can pace it to match our pacing guide. So when a student is working on their first unit in science, their textbook reflects unit one, chapter one. That's gonna exactly mimic what they are doing in class instead of, okay, for the first unit, we're gonna to go to chapter seven. But then when we get to unit two, it's chapter 12, and then a little bit of chapter four. You know, that can be really confusing. And with this, it aligns directly with our pacing guide. And they can be printed as a PDF. So if we need a student that needs an official copy, we can get print shot, get a nice little bound book or whatever, and we can, they can have an official copy of that as well. So that's the beauty of the CK-12 product. And we will be using that product for sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. And the amazing thing here, only two teachers did not pick this as their number one choice. They picked it as their number two. So of all of the 50, 48, 50 middle school teachers, only two chose it as their second resource. Mm. So it's a very powerful tool. It integrates and embeds with Canvas perfectly. They don't have to bring links in, they can just put the assignment right there and it takes them directly to the website. And so it, it I think it's great for differentiated learning when you've got learners of different levels, they, they, it just puts it right there for them and there's not a lot of fumbling around in the textbook. It has the interactives right there for them at their fingertips. And then one other, I think, amazing thing about the OER, Open Educational Resource, is that typically the past textbook adoptions when you're talking about content have, have come in around $1.5 million. And because of our ability to use CK-12, as a resource for our teachers, our textbook adoption is coming in less than half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So because this, we have saved approximately a million dollars and possibly more depending on how everything aligned. And so all AP teachers will get the materials they need. Electives will finally get updated books that aren't 14 years old. <laughs> uh, chemistry gets an EOC book. And then every other content <coughs> gets a 
perfectly aligned paste textbook for their course and the beauty is the other courses they can build those too so it's not like we are limited with ck12 just for the contents that we're selecting it for it's still a resource that everybody can use still and it's not a resource that's going anywhere any away anytime soon and then for the textbooks that we are adopting the vendors have already assured me that once the textbook happens they will provide professional development and We'll set up times that if we need to Zoom, we'll Zoom. If the teacher's not available, most of them either have the resource on a video set or they will record the webinars that they present to our teachers and I'll have access and I can put them in our district uh, curriculum Google Drive. So having said that, <laughs> in a condensed amount of time, is there any questions? Questions? Yes, Ms. Amon. Um, I just, I probably a couple they probably feed on each other the list of textbooks being adopted and purchased are the ones that were out there yes, this past spring yes ma'am they're for high school correct those were all secondary yes ma'am 9 through 12 9 through 12 so the open educational resource is more 6 through 8 well uh, biology and earth science will also be using that. okay uh, but that has not been available for the public or for us to review to date, correct? <clears throat> True. Okay. Will there be a time that we can get our, you know, take a look at uh, it or if the public wanted to see Honestly, it? anyone can log in, but I can figure out a way to make that accessible for you to, for you to look at. It has been in place is the reason I didn't. And has it, okay. Yes, um, yes, and does it align with the Virginia standards? Because yes, I noticed their website, their Common Core derived. So. Yes, it does. But and the the reason it can is because we build and select the materials based on the SOLs that will be in our textbooks. Okay. And so is this this is not new or it is new? It's the second. We were using it because we had a gap between our textbooks expiring, and then having the adoption because the state had not put out a list. So what we're essentially doing, the textbooks that we have in middle school, mm -hmm. every we have enough still that every classroom will have a class set. So they'll have the approved Pearson books for a class set, but they also have this for their digital access. Okay, but it's something that the teachers have been working with and yes, using for yes, a period of time. Okay. Yes ma'am, probably about 16 months now. Mm -hmm. All right, other questions? Yes, Ms. Erzlaw. Um, I find the admin standards pacing app to be one of the greatest things um, in Newport News that is available. Will the resources for um, books and um, like CK-12, will it be aligned such that you would be able to kind of see where, what you need textbook-wise um, speaks to the criteria in the app? Oh, 100%. Okay. 100%. That's going to be very resourceful. Okay. And as a matter of fact, I emailed you the copy of the sixth grade before your class. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? All right, so I'll just ask one question similar to Ms. Amon. Uh, can we, uh, the board, get copies of the you know, digital copies uh, and or the physical copies of the book between now and the, I believe we're going to be uh, making an action item out of this in the next month. Um, so can we, can we get a... A version that we can all log into and see and I can also download a PDF and I can uh, uh, push that to Miss Buffalo and Excellent. she can forward that out to everybody wonderful thank you Excellent. so with that being said I just want to want to make, make a mention that he he was he was very apprehensive about doing this report himself and you did a wonderful job yes, we rarely have supervisors come forward and present <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you, sir, for, for your preparedness and, and, uh, and presenting this evening. Um, I'd also, Mr. Chairman, like to, I know we finished our back to school report, but my folks, my supervisors left before they, um, before we had a chance to acknowledge their work. But um, I just, I really will, um, wanted the board to, to acknowledge the, just the detailed work that our staff has done during yeah. this, um, yeah, this portion sure. of report. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll, and I'll save any other comments to, report, to my report time, Mr. Chairman. I'm being bad here. Thank you. All right, wonderful. So that, that moves on item 5.04. Uh, so similar to our item 5.02, board members have a written copy of this report in their packets. 
Are there any uh, objections or, or quest objections to moving forward to item 5.05, or are there questions at this time? All right. Seeing none, then we will move to comments by the superintendent on item 5.05. So, Dr. Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yours. I just couldn't wait to say thank you before <laughs> folks started leaving um, <laughs> for, for the great work that, that they're doing. And um, we, we uh, it, it's, a, it's a, one, a um, bittersweet, and I don't know if she's still uh, listening in, but it was helping out with this back to school report. But this will be uh, Mrs. Rousseau's last school board meeting. Um, and I know that she's not here in person today, but her presence is always felt. Her advisement is always um, um, given appropriately and accurately. And, um, and I just wanted to acknowledge the great work that she has done for the school division for numerous years. And I think we'll find a more formal way to do that. And I hope she's listening in because I want to I want to just embarrass her and say that, you know, she, she is one of, she is really a cornerstone of our school division in terms of two important areas, operations and, and business services, two areas where we also um, exceed and, uh, and excel other school divisions and are nationally recognized repeatedly for our business operations. And I would just like to uh, humbly give her a some kudos tonight and thank her for her years of service. And her acknowledgement. And we couldn't, we couldn't, uh, I know we, we will try to fill shoes, but sometimes you can't fill shoes too, too the shoes are very large that need to be filled. And uh, we just want to thank her for her work with the school division. So Mary Lou, if you're listening, we appreciate you and uh, we, we will miss you sorely um, as you uh, move on to bigger and better things in retirement. And uh, that's always a good, a good thing. Um, thank you, Dr. Parker. I am still listening. I am appropriately Hello. embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with that being said, now that I've done that, <laughs> as, uh, as you've heard our back to school report earlier this evening, we are looking forward to welcoming all students back to school for in-person instruction on Wednesday, September 8th. And I'm excited to announce the premier airing of our state of, of the schools um, back to school launch, okay, which will be held on Monday, August 30th at 7 p.m. This has been an ongoing work with a lot of folks, many hands in the pot, but we wanted to have something that would showcase our school division um, and a positive way, and what better way than to hear from some of our students, our parents, our teachers, and around the time when school's starting to get folks back into the uh, spirit of uh, what Newport News Public Schools is about. So we hope we accomplish that in this, uh, in this little broadcast on August 30th uh, around our um, back to school um, happenings. Uh, join us um, to learn more about our strategic plan during this program at Profile of a Learner, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the other academic and social programs that we have. More importantly, we'll hear reflections from some of our key stakeholders. Um, so with that being said, that will take place. Uh, the following day, we will do a Facebook Live session, which will begin at 6.30 to 7.30 and get into the nuts and bolts of some of the information that was shared tonight and answer questions from our community, make sure that we are responding appropriately to the information that's both posted online, but also is go will go out um, electronically and to homes. So we invite families, students, and staff, and the community to hear more about our back to school plans. You may post questions via Facebook during that time, and we respond to those questions live during this session. So please mark your calendars for August 31st at 6.30 for our Facebook Live session. Um, and uh, that concludes my remarks, Mr. Chairman. A lot of bitters, again, a bittersweet evening with uh, with a very important uh, member of our team uh, uh, leaving us. And uh, I thank the board for your continued support of students and uh, the leadership as we move into a new school year. We're still excited about the great opportunities that our students will have this year. So thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Dr. Parker. Uh, we are now on item six, and I know we took a lot of cards tonight, but we'll ask, are there any other cards? Madam Clerk, do we have any other cards? No, sir. All right. There being uh, no additional cards, and we are on to matters by the school board. And I, by my watch, it's about 10.30. Let's see if you all can finish this before 11 o'clock. Uh, Ms. Patterson as our student rep, welcome. Uh, we promise that every meeting is not like this, uh, not going this long, but uh, please uh, go ahead and we'll let, let you have the floor to speak first if you have any comments. I do not have any comments right now. All right. <laughs> she's, al she's already a pro. Why? <laughs> exactly. Smart girl. Move. Okay, Mr. Ely. Just want to thank everybody for the amazing presentations and thank this board for working together and doing what's best for the citizens of Newport News. Thank you, Mr. Ely. Dr. Best? No comments. All right. Ms. Amon? 
Um, I'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, thank you to everyone for the presentations and working hard on getting schools back open and back in session. And I just want to thank the community members that came out and spoke on, on different issues and both sides of the issues. It's really encouraging to see the community engaged uh, and involved in what we're doing here in Newport News. So thank you to everyone who came out. All right, Mr. Harris. Uh, Ms. Russo, uh, thank you for all your uh, long service and long and dedicated service to the Newport News Public School System uh, and enjoy your retirement. Uh, well deserved. Also, uh, Ms. Patterson, welcome aboard uh, to the uh, school board. I uh, think you're a great addition. I'm sure you learned a lot tonight. <laughs> <That's hard. laughs> um, and that was a good response for now, all right? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and welcome back to school. Uh, Dr. Parker, thank you for your leadership and uh, your staff members uh, for their presentation today. And I uh, just look forward to getting back to school and getting back to normal. Thank you. That's it, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Mr. Hunter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, uh, Ms. Russo, if you're still listening, uh, we're, you're gonna, we're gonna miss you. It's gonna be uh, some big shoes to fill. But again, thank you for your service here to uh, Newport News Public Schools over the years and the excellent um, handling of our books. Um, um, that being said, again, <laughs> so hopefully we'll get the opportunity to do a, a really nice celebration for you on your way. Again, thanks for um, all the folks that came out and commented on some tough decisions this evening. And, um, great things are happening in Newport News Public Schools. And we look forward to a phenomenal and exciting uh, upcoming school year. All right, Madam Vice Chair. Looking forward to a phenomenal school year. Um, it, the framework and the scaffolding are there, as we can tell by the presentations we've had tonight. I hope everybody's rested and well. We promise not to do this to you frequently. Um, but we had some, uh, some serious business to to step off with, and I'm really glad that we were able to hear from the community um, and their feedback as well. Um, Mary Lou, it's <clears throat> gonna be really weird around here without you. Um, thank you for your many years of service, your wisdom, your patience, your grace, um, and your frankness. I have really um, learned to uh, rely on that, so I will miss you very, very much. Ms. Patterson, I'm Glad to have you on the board. It's nice to see a new face down there and um, enjoy this time period with us and we're gonna keep you busy, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, so I will try to close this out quickly. I'll echo the comments that uh, Ms. Rousseau, uh, personally, I thank you for your many decades of service. and uh, I've learned a tremendous amount from you. I thank you for your patience in I know I asked, I asked you a lot of questions and you were always willing to answer all of them. Uh, and so I thank you for um, helping me to be a better board member because uh, 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 all of the answers that you gave were very, always very, very helpful. And we won national recognition under your leadership for our books several times. Uh, we've won finance uh, awards and recognition. So uh, I want you to know that, that, uh, that we notice, the board notices and we are very proud of the work that, that you've done and have been appreciative to, of being able to work with you. So we wish you all the best in retirement. Um, Thanks so much. And uh, to the staff, I want to thank you all for uh, staying with us a late night and uh, staying with us all the way to the board. We said this during our planning retreat. We didn't mind, you know, if we stayed here till midnight. So we almost got it tonight. So we won't, uh, we won't push it till midnight. I won't keep talking that, that long. Uh, I just want to thank the, the public that I'm very proud of, of our public and the way that they conducted themselves this evening. We had a very contentious and difficult issue. We had more than 20 speakers. We managed within an hour to get all 20 of the speakers um, in and, and allow them to speak. Everyone was able to be heard. Uh, people were, their views and, and opinions were respected. So I just, I have my, tonight my hat's, off is to, my hat's off to our community mm -hmm. for, um, taking some very emotional and, and difficult uh, issues and being able to conduct themselves in a, in a manner fitting of Newport News. And that's, that's what we come to expect. So we're very, I'm just very proud of that. And I don't want that to uh, go unnoticed because it doesn't go without saying that uh, 
I've seen some some uh, we've talked about over the summer boardroom board boardrooms gone wild and and none of that has happened in Newport News and I'm very proud of uh, of the way that our public conducts themselves and proud of the, that's the master board training that we have gone through so I'd like to feel that uh, some of the master board work that we've done that's the reason why we are able to conduct a, a, what I feel is a, a smooth meeting so with that thank you all and we will see you again next month